Good morning. Uh, we're going to get started this morning with an invocation uh, by Michael Deerham. Is that, is that correct, Michael? I want to get that right. Michael Deerham, pastor of Sunnyside Baptist Church, and that'll be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Millie Washington of Girl Scouts Troop 719. Please stand. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you here today, and I thank you so much for your faithfulness to your word. You keep your promises. I thank you for your grace that you have bestowed upon all mankind in giving your Son, who is the light of the world. And I thank you that even now he reigns from your right hand as the risen Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords, the magistrate over all magistrates. And I ask on behalf of the mayor and the city manager and these councilmen and councilwomen that you would grant to them wisdom, that they would think of you first and think of you most, and that you would grant to them understanding of how to love their neighbors rightly and how to steward your creation righteously. And I pray for the prosperity of this city, that you would bring peace, that where there is unrighteousness, that you would bring righteousness, and that where there is suffering, that you would bring healing, and where there is folly, that you would exchange this for wisdom, and in so doing, bring great blessing to all who live here, and we thank you for hearing our requests as needy children seeking the blessing of a heavenly Father. We pray these things for the sake of Jesus Christ, the one with whom you are well pleased. Amen. Please stand and join me at the American flag. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Millie. Okay, I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and we will begin with item three, Office of the Mayor, uh, and we do have a resolution, and I will ask Lauren Yontz to join me at the front. Welcome, Lauren. First of all, thank you for the service you provide our young people every day, other than this morning. First, thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for being here. But we would like to learn a little bit more about that, and so I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Lauren Yant has been named Teacher of the Month for December 2022 by the Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. And whereas Lauren is a sixth and seventh grade science and avid teacher at Class and School of Advanced Studies Middle School, where she developed her philosophy of creating equitable classrooms where both students and teachers are valued. And whereas Lauren has acquired a Master's of Education in teaching English as a second language from the University of Central Oklahoma, a Master's of Education in Higher Education from the University of Oklahoma, and a Bachelor's of Arts in Applied Communication from Oklahoma Baptist University. And whereas Lauren became duly certified in early childhood and elementary education in 2015 and has since gained experience teaching various grades including kindergarten, second grade, fifth grade, and now sixth and seventh grade. And whereas Lauren considers it her responsibility to meet her students where they are by providing a space where they know they are enough, where they can make mistakes, ask questions, and learn together without fear of judgment. And whereas Lauren truly believes that when a student knows they are supported by a teacher, not only in the classroom, but in all aspects of their life, it can greatly improve the student-teacher relationship. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City 
that they do hereby recognize and commend Lauren Yaunt on her selection as December 2022 Teacher of the Month by the Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Thank you, and um, it sounds like your classroom is a special place to be, and that's why you're here today. <laughs> um, well, that's awesome. Well, we would love to hear a few words from you, and uh, then, of course, we're, we're going to pass this resolution, uh, I suspect, and express our gratitude to you in a formal way. But, but first of all, we'd love to hear from you, Lauren. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, education in Oklahoma City is a very special thing. We have some of the best and brightest kids here in Oklahoma City, and I feel honored and privileged just to be in their presence every day. Over the last few years, as you all know, we have gone through COVID. The education system was virtual, then we were in person, and so we've had a lot of up, ups and downs. But I'm here to say that our kids are resilient, our teachers are resilient, and um, we just, we have done so well this last year bringing kids back into the classroom. And so I just want you all to know and be proud of the students that are graduating here in Oklahoma City because they are going to do big things for our world. No doubt, no doubt. Well, thank you. Well, let's get a, a motion and a second on this uh, resolution recognizing Lauren. I feel like we're on a game show. Yes, join me and let's see how this works out. Yes, we have a motion to second. Please cast your votes. I would like to vote aye. Passes unanimously. Let's hear it for Lauren and show our gratitude. Okay, and uh, we also have item 3B on Office of the Mayor. That's the appointment of Mike Adams to serve as a member of the Trails Advisory Committee. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Oh, how would you like to vote, James? Passes unanimously. All right, that concludes Office of the Mayor. It brings us to items from Council, which there are none today. So we'll proceed to item five, City Manager reports. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we just have one report on today. I don't have a presentation. It's one of our Council priority updates on upholding high standards for all city services. We report on these periodic periodically on performance measures that the employee, that our different departments track, and so it just gives you an update on that. So we'll be happy to answer questions on that if you have any. Um, that's all that I have. All right. <clears throat> item six is Journal of Council Proceedings. We have items A and B we could take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Mayor, before we continue, I'm having a hard time hearing from this. It's very hard to hear. So I don't know if it's just me or if others are having a hard time hearing, but I, it's, 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 it's very working. hard. The speaker's not working. Yeah. Okay. Am I amplified at all or? Just the speakers over there aren't working. Okay. Um, all right. Item seven is a uh, request for uncontested continuances. Oh, by the way, did I declare that vote? It passed unanimously. All right, we have item 11N on item 7, which is listed on the agenda, which will be deferred to January. What else do we have, Mr. City Manager? So we have um, on page 10, we have item 11E under PUD 1900. This will be deferred to December the 20th. On page 12, item 11P1, unsecured structures. The following items will be stricken from the agenda. Item A, 6441 South Drexel Avenue, the owner is secured. Item B, 2115 Southeast 12th Street, the owner is secured. Item C, 421 Northwest 16th Street, the owner is secured. Item D, 3216 Southwest 21st Street, the owner is secured. And item F, 1415 Northwest 34th Street, the owner is secured. 
on item 11 Q1 on page 12 under abandoned housing. These items are all stricken from the agenda. Item A, 2115 Southeast 12th Street, the owner is secured. Item B, 421 Northwest 15th, 16th Street, the owner is secured. Item E, 3216 Southwest 21st Street, the owner is secured. And item E, the last one is item C, item E, 1415 Northwest 34th Street, owner, the owner is secured. And that's all the items I have. Okay, and you mentioned 11N, right? You did. Yeah. That was there, did you the also mention the other one that we were thinking? 11E. 11E. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Got it. All right. So Item, was, it, was it E and N? E and N. Thank you 11. very much. Yes. Okay. Item 8, are revocable permits and events. Uh, Item 8A is an activity and use agreement with Arts Council Oklahoma City for opening night and the finale 5K on December 31st at uh, various locations downtown uh, we have we have a, a, a passing of the baton here with both Angela Cosby and Peter Delisi here uh, to present on this item hello I am Angela Cosby and I became the executive director of Arts Council OKC in June I am so excited to be uh, well returning to this organization I was previously the festival director eight years ago opening night is going into its 37th year as the annual New Year's Eve celebration we have nine venues kicking off at 7 p.m. we have performances by some of our local favorites including Serafina Bird Edgar Cruz perpetual motion dance and many many others we'll have 11 food trucks on coal cord um, lots of fun family activities wristbands are currently on sale at Duncan many on queue locations and on our website at www.artscouncilokc.com and yeah Peter's last day with the Arts Council will be on New Year's Eve so quite the celebration so you please come Bands. out Bands, fireworks, so yeah, we are throwing him quite the party, but I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity for him to speak about the finale stage, and of course, thank you for years of support. So Peter, take it away. I will start the clock, because he likes to talk. So, so the, no, usually so literally there's, a lot of, the, there's a lot of brevity that goes on at this podium. So, so the, uh, the, 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 you're saying that the city will literally count down the final seconds of your yes, time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And I mean, how many people get to go out with a, a fireworks display, you know, at midnight? It is kind of an interesting last day of work. I'll start about 6.30 that morning and then leave downtown, probably about 2 o'clock, 2.30 on the New Year's Day. But it's been a wonderful ride for me being involved with the Arts Council for so many years and getting a chance to work with so many amazing departments within the city of Oklahoma City, which they all get involved with our Countdown to Midnight show for New Year's Eve. And uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure to work with everyone here. I did, I think, yeah, there's Drew right there. The, uh, the PIO's office uh, is instrumental in helping us all the time with uh, making sure we get in touch with the right people to get things accomplished uh, in an appropriate manner. But it's been a pleasure, and a pleasure having the opportunity to come before you as a, as a body of amazing representatives for our city. And uh, just thank you so much for everything you do for your service to Oklahoma City. It's been a privilege. Well, yeah. Peter, your time there has been legendary, and uh, you've given this city so many memories, and uh, we're so grateful for your service. Thank you. But we are here actually to approve uh, an activity and use agreement for the event. Uh, Councilwoman Hammond. I know this is always a really uh, well attended. Uh, folks look forward to it quite a bit, so I'm excited to move for approval. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and welcome, Angela. <laughs> okay, we're going to recess the uh, council meeting and convene now as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, where we have items A through E we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have items A and B we could take with one motion.
We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCPPA and reconvene as the council where we find ourselves um, at item nine, the consent docket. Uh, there is a scheduled presentation at item AS. Adam Sam. And that's it. Is there any other item that uh, a member of the council wishes to pull out for separate vote or separate discussion or questions? Mayor, would you mind uh, item AE, just a, a kind of public update on that, please? And then um, item AJ. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I need to step out um, for item X. Okay. Um, and then I'd also like to have a discussion about item F and B A. F and E A. E A. Yes. Oh, wait. What was the second one? I'm sorry. B A B A B A. B -A got it. Okay. Anything else? All right, just, just for the, it's not quite in order, but just for the sake of simplicity, I might go ahead and do the separate vote first. Um, that's at 9X. This is a resolution authorizing the submission of an application for a continuum of care federal grant funds uh, to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, et cetera. We take a motion on this item only. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, now we will go back in order, which would bring us to item F that Councilwoman Hammond, you wish to speak on. Yes, um, I just wanted to hear more from staff about this item. Um, so if it looks like we have Jason and some of our other staff available, if they can just kind of speak to the history of uh, this request and um, kind of the reasoning behind it, that'd be great. Sorry, did that again. So good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, Jason Fairbrush, um, Assistant City Manager and Director of Public Transportation and Parking. Um, thank you for uh, letting us make a few comments about this item. It is um, <clears throat> uh, something that this council hasn't seen before in the fact that uh, the proposed item is actually um, expanding the current uh, public safety helicopter fleet. Um, as you can see in the, uh, the item or the memo before you, um, it is a, a estimated to be a $3.7 million purchase uh, funded through um, our uh, use tax fund, which is typically how we replace uh, public safety vehicles. And the one thing um, I guess I would share with you on this item is <clears throat> we're really um, looking to purchase an additional uh, helicopter uh, to gain capacity. And um, <clears throat> when I first started talking to the chiefs about this, um, the way it made sense to me is thinking um, through, the, through the transit lens that I, that I also uh, work through, um, we actually own 20% more buses than, than, we're, than, than we need to put um, our service on the street. And so we have those extra buses for capacity because we have uh, you know, breakdowns, we have scheduled service, so we have to have more vehicles than we actually need to uh, perform the service. And I kind of see um, this item um, in a similar fashion in that by purchasing an additional police helicopter, it gives the really both public safety departments uh, more capacity to use those aircraft because, for example, right now with two, if one is down for maintenance, and I was actually just um, out at the, I don't know if they call it the shop, but anyway, where they parked the helicopters, um, and one was um, uh, being worked on and was, and was down. So that means we have you know, one helicopter to serve the city. And, and where I think this is um, uh, interesting is that FIRE has been exploring ways to use these aircraft to uh, also improve their public safety response, specifically through the ability to uh, use equipment to drop water to put out wildfires. Um, they're also looking at it for applications in the areas of uh, swift water uh, rescues. And so 
what you run into is we basically have uh, two public safety departments now that can use these aircraft. We have a fleet of two, sometimes it becomes a limitation. So that's kind of the overview, and of course we have uh, uh, Chief Kelly and Chief Gorley here also to answer any you know, specific questions that you might have. Um, I guess my first question is why then, if, if sort of the idea of use is more targeted towards fire, why this wouldn't be a fire purchase, if that makes sense? Yeah, I'll probably turn it over to the chief here, but, but my initial response is we, uh, the fire department can benefit from having the, the helicopter or the aircraft different times throughout the year, but it's not something that I think would probably be needed on a, like on a daily basis. Whereas if it's used between both public safety departments, I, I would think there would just be more, uh, and, and we do also, use I, mean, the I would say also that we've already got the training, the equipment, the shop, all of those things that are there for the pilots that are through the police department. So it's not now splitting that out between two departments. It would just be, we'd be able to share the services. Good morning, Mayor, Council, uh, Richard Kelly, Fire Chief. Um, yeah, th that's a good question, and, and when we look at it from the perspective, I think, as the city manager said, there's a lot of training that goes in the hours and the pilots and the operation. So with we already have trained personnel and their experience, it just, you know, it's a good area to leverage and work together. And, it, and I think, too, it shows solidarity. We work together in a lot of different areas of USAR, um, different training that we do every day and so it just allows us to expand upon that and and work together and, and, and right now we're exploring this so as we go through it we don't know how many operational uh, how many operations we'll deal with on an annual basis I think as we grow and we learn from that we'll be able to work together and, and support each other in that but I think it makes sense now in that in that piece to be able to do it through one department that has the experience and the pilots and the capability and I, I know working with the pilots too, they are very excited about it. You know, they, they've taken it on, really worked with us very well. They're very good when you see them operate. So it's something we can, uh, you know, cabbage onto their experience and capabilities. Um, and I sort of heard you speak to it, but I guess how often have we been experiencing these like conflicts, I guess, with fire needs sure. um, and, and when not being available? Like, I'm just kind of curious how that's. Our, our last year, I think that we had a lot of serious conflagrations was probably 2017, but every year we experience, you know, a large amount of wildland urban interface fires, and especially with the growth of the city, as everyone's seeing, the, the housing and the, where we're growing, that's a lot more challenges for us, and, it, and it's a great capability. As we said, I think as we go through this process, we'll learn and see how we can use it more and more. Um, now, there is a part that fire does play in that. We have crew chiefs. And we have uh, officers that work with them. They're actually trained to work with the pilots. So those are being provided through fire personnel. So it is, again, a, a team effort working together to do that. But, so we haven't, ha we haven't experienced a time when we needed the capacity for fire uh, abatement but haven't had the vehicle available? Going back, you were just asking about the years of conflagration. I'm sorry, I may misunderstand your question. I apologize. Um, we've used, we have had the capability to use the Army National Guard. Um, the Army National Guard does uh, this type of operation. The challenge you have, just like this year, they're deployed, they're not even available. And, and we believe with the growth of the city and what we're seeing, we need to be able to provide that service internally. So in the past, we could call the state. Now, again, that's a, a request, and that has been utilized in the past. And uh, now as we see that having it internally, we have a lot more controls on that. We can use it when we need it. And what was the challenge in the past, it had to be a large conflagration before they would even deploy that resource. Now we can use it working together to not get to that level, to actually mitigate it at a smaller level so mm -hmm. we're not seeing that conflagration that we're burning down houses and, <coughs> and, and having the challenges there. I hope that answered your it, question. It well. sort of does, but I think what I'm still curious about is why the current fleet is not enough to be able to address what you just ex described, those kind of smaller, why what we currently have, why if we just, if we didn't purchase an additional helicopter, 
why our current fleet is not sufficient to meet that need. Well, I think it comes back to, again, the capability of the, of the resources of the police department because we are, when we use that for uh, a wildland urban event, we could be there. We have operational periods that's lasted for three and four days, 12 hour operational periods. At that point, now Chief Gorley doesn't have the capability of that helicopter, or if they're down to one helicopter, he may have to pull it off to utilize it for other situations in law enforcement. Now we're competing for resources. So I really think what we're coming back to is not, not saying that there has been a conflict, not sure. suggesting, right. making sure we've got the availability of resources. Right, yes, well, yes sir. <coughs> I was going to say, you know, to right, I think getting at the question specifically is like how many times have we wanted to use a helicopter and we can't uh, for fire purposes? Well, we haven't, the thing, the problem is I mean, we haven't done a lot of that. So it's hard to, we don't have uh, a lot of data to say, well, we, we wish we right. could have used one on such and such day because as the chief said, you know, in the past we were able to rely on occasion on the on the National Guard. I think now that actually does that actually have to be approved by the governor by the now. Governor, so it's a from the governor. it's a little it's a little bit laborious to try to get that approval. So um, not not to uh, not answer the question directly. We just don't have it because we haven't used the aircraft in that in that manner until now, which is what we're wanting to do, or I should say, the public safety departments are wanting to do. But, so, but then the other piece is my understanding is we aren't going to, at least in the near term, hire additional crews to operate. So I guess then the concern is do we, when does the conflict come where we don't have enough people to operate multiple vehicles that when one is at fire and there's another need? You want to take that one, Chief yeah. Gorley, about current pilot capacity? So. It's not just about pilot capacity, it's the uh, equipment that is on the aircraft. You have to, we have to take off some of the equipment that's on the aircraft for police functions in order to utilize the equipment needed for the fire function and for the water drops. The aircraft is built for that, but um, the mission equipment is different. And so when you take a, an aircraft and you're gonna start you know, working fires with it and have that available, it's not gonna be as ready to be you know, mission ready for a police function. And that doesn't mean that, you know, it'll sit there in either a fire or a police capacity because we can swap out both relatively quickly. But once we swap it out and we start that fire mission, that aircraft is going to be doing that fire mission until it's completed. Also, too, these aircraft, um, they're very complicated to maintain. They have very strict maintenance schedules that they have to meet. And so you rotate between the two to make sure that they're not meeting those maintenance schedules at the same time. Doing a fire mission increases the burden on the aircraft and can speed up some of those maintenance requirements too. And so what you can have very easily is you can have two aircraft down at the same time because they're both on different maintenance schedules. And so the third aircraft allows us to rotate through to always have an aircraft available. Um, and really the goal is to have one available at any time for police missions. And so that's, that's kind of the complicated And I think too, just it. on that question, the portion about the, the number of pilots and making sure that we've got the staffing that we need, I think that's gonna be the part where as we start to initiate this process and work on that, right now we believe that we can manage with our current staff, but at some point it could get to that place where we believe that we need to add to that. And we would definitely work through that and, and manage based upon what that demand is. But right now we believe we can manage it with the staff we have. Well, if we, if we are having that type of issue as well as maintenance and all of the things that we're talking about, I guess my, my question is, you know, I go to different galas and events and I see that there's an opportunity for people to win a silent auction to ride in a helicopter. So if we have these types of, of maintenance concerns and want to limit that type of access, why are we doing that? Those that, those that you see, number one, they're, they're fundraisers for um, agencies that we support and work with, such as Palomar, the YWCA. Um, those are the only reasons that we do those is we're, it's part of a joint mission that we have together and they're fundraisers to help support those agencies and those organizations. Those are not separate flights that are done. It's not something we just take the helicopter up and take somebody for a ride. Those are um, regular patrol missions and someone is allowed to ride along. And I would compare it to um, when someone comes out and does a ride along with a police officer in their patrol car. It's the same thing. The helicopter's already up performing a mission and these folks are riding along with them. 
Well, I guess, I guess my qu my concern in, in that is, I don't recall ever knowing as as a citizen that I could just ride in a helicopter mm -hmm. and, and fly up on a mission just as I've done with a ride along. Um, so I, I guess that's part of why I'm confused as to how we're able to do do all of the things that we're doing and now ask for another one to do more of that um, and more capacity to do that. So that's just how I feel about it. Chief, how many other cities our size have three plus helicopters? Uh, there, there's several. I couldn't give you an exact number, but I can tell you, um, you know, being part of major city chiefs, uh, well, for example, um, uh, Houston, Dallas, I mean, they're, they're other major cities. Uh, they're, they're bigger cities in population, not in land mass, but in metro area, we're about the same size. Um, Houston's about the same size land-wise. Uh, they're pretty close to us. They have multiple aircraft. Um, a lot of agencies have different types of aircraft. They have fixed wing and uh, um, you know helicopters as well. But a lot of it too, the reason you see multiple aircrafts in a lot of cities is because they're doing multiple mission types. They're doing rescues, they're doing um, you know, fire related services. And so when you start getting into increased missions like that, you, you do see those agencies having multiple aircraft. Uh, Councilman, I think somewhat related to that question is um, we, uh, I know the chief and his staff also provide support to the other communities mm -hmm. uh, when, when they need the, the aircraft as well. I don't know if you want to speak yeah, to that. Yeah, there's only um, three agencies in Oklahoma, law enforcement agencies that have aircraft. It's us, Tulsa, and OHP. Um, OHP only has one aircraft right now. But, uh, you know, I, I've said before in, in front of council that, you know, our responsibility, it's not a bragging right to be the largest agency in the state. It's a responsibility. And we have a responsibility to help other agencies because they run into incidents like missing children and other things that, uh, you know, um, uh, hostage situations that are back on rural property that they can't get officers back to safely and the air uh, support is used to provide sort of a, an eye to that as well. We've done that in many occasions outside the Oklahoma City area. So we do provide services to other agencies uh, to help them. And this helps us also reduce those pursuits that we could get into, we can actually track them more from the sky when we have the, the abilities to do so, correct? Our pursuit uh, procedure actually uh, states that the aircraft, if airborne or even if not, they'll, they'll get in the air and uh, respond to every pursuit. The goal is if they can get over a pursuit, the ground pursuit can terminate. It's a lot safer to monitor it from the air, wait till they stop and exit the vehicle and take them in custody then. So they, it does make um, pursuits a lot safer because we don't have to necessarily pursue them on the ground. Thank you. Chief, how long have we had um, fire apparatus equipment for our helicopters? Was that just recently that we acquired that or have we had it b before last year? Uh, into March last year is when, okay. we, when we started. And actually the two aircraft that we have now, when we uh, received those back in, um, I believe it was 2016, um, those aircraft were equipped for firefighting missions. So it was always a plan to add these, okay. you know, going down the road. It just took us a while to get there. There's a lot of training that has to go into with the pilots. Um, just a lot we had to learn about doing it and be ready. And so, you know, now we're, now we're to that point. But uh, um, I, I think it's going to it really increase the capabilities in public safety in the Oklahoma City metro area. Thank you. But so what I'm hearing is that we do have enough personnel to operate two at the same time. Correct. Because I guess my concern would be that if there is some kind of pursuit that needs, you know, and then there's a fire need, you know, are those going to be conflicting? How, like, how do those things become prioritized if, are we, do we always have two people available on shift to hop in the, the craft at any moment? Kind of just trying to understand how that works. The pilots are also subject to call out, so we could call in pilots that are off duty and, and meet the need if we have a, a, a dual incident running at the same time. Okay. Um, I think those are all my questions, but I think I would like to vote on this separately. Okay, so uh, there's a request to vote on item F separately, which I'm sure we can accommodate. Um, do we have a, why don't we go ahead and do that? Why don't, do we have a motion uh, to approve item F?
That's, that's not possible. Is there a... <laughs> it's, got, it's got Councilman Stone cipher on twice. There we go. We have a motion and a second. And what's this? Oh, we're getting it again. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes six to one. Okay, moving on to item AE, Councilman Cooper. Yes, just wanted to hear a public update on, as I've mentioned before, a pretty significant uh, infrastructure improvement. It's not a big, not a big deal uh, in terms of what this item is doing, anything outside of what we've done, heard previously. I just wanted to be able to have that public update where we are. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Councilman Eric Quinger, Public Works Director, Oklahoma City. Um, this item AE is actually a change order to a construction project that's already underway um, to our super span drainage structure that's in the vicinity of Penn Square Mall in the Belle Isle area. Um, it's an underground structure, so the work that's underway is not visible for passersby. Um, it's a large drainage structure that uh, um, has some uh, maintenance needs that are underway. We're actually doing repairs inside um, the the steel tube um, that makes up for that drainage. Um, it has some turnbuckles and some deterioration that just occurred over time. It requires periodic maintenance. And so what this change order is actually doing is the contractor that's working inside um, the super span has located some additional repairs that are needed. Um, this change order is for $58,400 to do some additional tension rods and turnbuckle repairs that just weren't identified when the project was bid. Um, the work actually began earlier this year in 2022. Um, we're on track to finish up the construction in the spring of 23. So, um, and again, it's not visible from, from driving by, um, but, uh, but work's well underway. Thank you, Director Winger. Stay with you, Councilman Cooper, for AJ. Yes. Um, would you kind of walk us through... Um, where we are with um, this, this particular item as it relates to sidewalks, specifically from Northwest Expressway uh, on Villa North uh, into the Belle Isle West and Belle Isle neighborhoods, where, where we're at, because I was a bit pleasantly surprised uh, by this item. Sure, so this item AJ is actually the consultant review report where we're at the place where we're requesting council's authorization uh, to negotiate a contract with an engineer that was interviewed to actually do the design of sidewalks that are part of the city's ARPA projects. And so this is about $3.2 million um, worth of new sidewalks that are coming directly out of Bikewalk OKC. Um, they're also out of the Strong Neighborhood Initiative, um, and they're part of our pedestrian priority areas. And so listed um, are eight different locations that include Villa from 16th to 30th. We also have a bike lane on that portion of Villa, so this sidewalk will complement that bike lane facility. Um, but seven other locations as well that were, were identified in bike walk. So Public Works and Planning just worked closely together to identify those locations for design. Um, we are not ready for construction. Um, we would start the design if council authorized us to negotiate the contract today. It likely would begin in the early 2023. Um, but we could begin work possibly on construction as early as late next year, fall 2023. I'm so sorry. I, miss, I misspoke. I was thinking of another um, MAPS-related sidewalk project. So I just want to clarify that in public. I just said Villa from Northwest Expressway. Um, but that's something separate. We'll talk about that another day. Uh, this, why it was on my mind, and I just want to make sure I'm very clear on that. Um, the reason why this was on my mind is because of the Northwest 30th Street from Villa to Pennsylvania. That is um, a Ward 2 area that many residents have requested sidewalks uh, for years. Um, and then the next leg that we're going to have to really think about is up to May Avenue where Northwest Class and High School is. That's another area that I hear a whole lot of requests for walkability. And so when I saw that we were doing this eastern leg of, uh, from Villa to Penn, it really stood out to me. So I really want to applaud staff 
for uh, hearing the residents. And I also just want to encourage residents too. I mean, it really is when you all bring these things to our attention and your advocacy really does help put these things on a list and as funds become available, which is a phrase that I have learned to internalize from Director Winger. <laughs> um, these, these moments can happen. So I, this is a huge deal for my ward. When do we anticipate um, kind of having some uh, more concrete um, in the ground here, did you say? So the plans will likely begin in the spring of 2023. I think mm -hmm. construction at the earliest will be fall of 2023. So we'll need to do that, the surveys and the designs for each of these areas to make sure that they're, they're added, they're ADA accessible, you know, we'll coordinate with, with any uh, things that are occurring in the field, the neighborhoods that we're working in. Now, I hate to put you on the spot, and if you don't have that answer, we can just pick this up whenever you and I and Director Butler have our next monthly Ward 2 meeting, but speaking of from Villa to May, do we have any sense of uh, which funding source we're kind of looking at to finish this job to get the kiddos to class in, or are we still just kind of keeping our eye on it for now? So I don't know that, so we're just, we're continuing to monitor and keeping our eye on that. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, that brings us to AS. This is a joint resolution with the Economic Development Trust. Uh, there'd be a final meeting on this December 20th, and it's in regards to a potential allocation of $1 million from our economic development incentives to canoe manufacturing. And I might, I might just throw in, because I've kind of been involved in these conversations for, for several years now. We've been in an ongoing conversation with our, with our potential partners from Canoe, as well as the state of Oklahoma. And um, it recently evolved in a way that you'll hear about today, but it's, a, it's an exciting uh, potential opportunity for the city. But we've been talking through this stuff uh, now really for at least two or three years, I think, um, about the potential for Canoe's presence in this region. And in early goings, it appeared Oklahoma City would not have as big of a role as we might have hoped, but that has recently changed, and that's why we're here today. So, Mr. City Manager. Yeah, so Jeff Seymour with the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce is here, and he's going to give us an introduction here. Chris Moore with Canoe is here to talk about the project and uh, the vision that they have for the projects out to the west part of the city. Well, good morning. Uh, Council, I really couldn't give a better introduction than the one that the mayor just gave, which is that we've been in conversations with this company for multiple years, thinking about different iterations and ways that uh, the company could have a physical presence um, in uh, the Oklahoma City metro area. Um, as the company iterated on different ideas, um, we were pleased that we stayed in constant conversation with them and were able to think about the opportunity to take an existing facility, which had lost in large part its manufacturing tenant and reuse it. Uh, for a next generation manufacturing facility. And so I'm pleased that Chris Moore, Vice President of Canoe, is here to talk about that um, proposal with you. Um, I would say out loud that um, when we think about incentives for companies like this and the way your uh, strategic incentive program is structured, it is performance based. So it does require that the company meet performance metrics, including jobs, employment, hiring, and capital investment. And then we pay out. Um, on a structured basis, uh, performance-based incentives back to them as a rebate. So uh, we're pleased that Chris is here. We're excited about this project and excited about the potential to add manufacturing investment um, in a portion of, of Oklahoma City that has long been a manufacturing hub. So with that, I'll introduce Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, on behalf of Canoe, um, we're very pleased to have this opportunity to address you this morning. I'm Chris Moore, a Vice President of Canoe, and I'm here with uh, Trey Hill from the Bradley Legal Firm, which has served as our Economic Development uh, and Site Selection Advisor. And would love to uh, just spend a few minutes uh, walking you through some information about our company, uh, where we are in our manufacturing journey, uh, why we have, uh, are looking so closely at an opportunity here in Oklahoma City uh, and some of the benefits uh, that we think um, could be there for both of us. Um, just moving to the next slide, um, Canoe is a manufacturer of award-winning electric vehicles. Uh, we pride ourselves on um, designing, engineering, uh, and building from the ground up uh, working vehicles for working people. Uh, you'll see the first two models uh, in, on this slide that we'll be bringing to market in the new year. Uh, we started our production, uh, commercial production, two weeks ago. 
uh, and we'll be bringing these first models uh, to market. Uh, one is a delivery van, uh, the other is a passenger uh, version of that same vehicle. Uh, we're very pleased that we've received a strong positive reaction in the marketplace. Uh, over the last few months, we've allowed, announced major orders uh, with Walmart, uh, with major vehicle leasing companies. Uh, we have also begun our journey uh, to supply vehicles to the federal government. Canoe was selected by NASA to provide the vehicles that will transport uh, U.S. astronauts to the launch pad for future Artemis moon missions. And uh, we delivered our first vehicle to the U.S. Army um, uh, just uh, last week in Michigan. Moving to the next slide, um, just a little bit about our manufacturing journey. Canoe is currently in uh, phase one of that journey, which you'll see on the far left slide of this slide. Uh, we're uh, working with a contract manufacturer uh, to build our initial uh, run of vehicles. We've previously announced uh, our phase three manufacturing plans, which you see on the far right of the slide. Uh, we will build our main factory uh, here in Oklahoma, out in uh, Mays County in northeast uh, part of the state. What was missing for us uh, was the middle of this, uh, which is how we bring our uh, manufacturing in-house and begin to scale that manufacturing. And we have been looking for uh, a site uh, to do that. We've recently announced that we will um, uh, build our battery modules um, at an existing um, site in northeast Oklahoma, and we have identified an existing uh, factory that we would like to acquire here in the Oklahoma City area um, and uh, for our main vehicle manufacturing uh, facility that would give us um, an ability to produce as many as 40,000 vehicles a year um, at that facility and meet some of the strong demand that we're seeing in the marketplace. We considered uh, a number of different options um, before uh, deciding that Oklahoma City was the right place for us, including um, options in Arkansas, Indiana, Michigan, uh, other sites in Oklahoma, um, as well as in Texas. Um, and in the end, um, Oklahoma City really won us over. Um, moving to the next slide, um, just a few of the things that made this the right uh, choice, we think, for us. Um, we were able to find an existing site uh, that has been used for manufacturing, um, and it uh, is of sufficient size for us to really scale our production. It's very well located uh, near major rail and interstate and uh, airport. Um, and uh, it also happens to have uh, an existing uh, dedicated training center that we can use uh, to, um, to do our uh, onboarding for our initial employees. Uh, so we think uh, this is an ideal site for us to, uh, to move forward. Moving to the next slide, um, uh, just some of our plans. We would be plan to begin hiring for this um, in the first half of 2023. Uh, would be looking to uh, employ initially about 550 people, um, and we will need to do some renovations of the existing facility to accommodate uh, our production lines, um, our paint shop, and upfitting of our vehicles. And just moving to the last slide, um, we see a significant opportunity not only for uh, Canoe to be um, uh, further expanding uh, our footprint and accelerating our production in the state of Oklahoma, but also some real opportunities for Oklahoma City. The electric vehicle sector is uh, quite dynamic and growing very quickly, uh, and this, uh, we think, is an excellent opportunity for Oklahoma City to, uh, to get involved in uh, this sector and at an early stage uh, when the city can realize um, uh, much of the growth that will occur here, uh, bringing in an uh, equipment manufacturer, a final assembler of vehicles, also gives the opportunity to attract some of our suppliers uh, to the city as well uh, and further contribute to um, the increasing diversity of the, uh, the region's economy. 
We're very um, focused on uh, some of the um, workforce development opportunities that we see here. A lot of great partners uh, in Oklahoma City that we can work with already, um, but really looking forward to, uh, to rolling up our sleeves uh, and being a part of uh, how we can help to train the workforce here uh, that we will need uh, and that other industries will need uh, here as well. So, um, Mr. Mayor, I'll conclude there, but very happy to answer any questions from the council. Okay, any questions for Chris? I have a couple questions. First, thank you for the presentation. Uh, one question, do we know exactly in the area where this uh, facility will be located? The, uh, the location of the facility, um, yes, we do. Um, it's an existing factory off of Interstate 40. Um, we can provide the, the exact address to you. Um, you can't do that now? Um, I don't it, have it in front of it's me, a, but it's... It's a, basically at I-40 and Morgan Road. It's okay. a former Terex that they're vacating that property. It's an existing facility out there at I-40 and Morgan Road. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, my second question, I saw we're trying to bring and working to bring about 550 jobs uh, to Oklahoma City. Uh, this is not a new ask. I ask this every time we have different companies and manufacturers come. Are you going to be a company that bans the box? And when I say ban the box, which that means are you going to uh, be a felon friendly company where we are able to employ our folks who have had felonies? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, first of all, we're, um, we're planning to hire quite a number of people over the next uh, 18 months to two years. So we're really looking for all qualified applicants um, for those positions. And um, for us, um, uh, second chances um, are very important. Um, and we would love to, uh, to work with you with others um, to see how there might be opportunities to, um, uh, to, um, to look at uh, some of the ways that we can um, help in that um, regard as well. So absolutely um, open to, um, uh, to, to looking at that and to, um, uh, to opportunities to bring um, those uh, workers into our workforce as well. Uh, and then my last question uh, about as far as the age, uh, what are there going to be the requirements as far as age to be employed by this company? Um, we would um, certainly comply with, uh, with all of the uh, age and hour uh, requirements that we have in the state. Um, we're looking for, uh, for a mix of employees. So we will have some engineering, some managerial employees that will require um, college degrees and, and years of experience. We also will be um, working um, to, um, the bulk of our employees will be uh, factory floor workers. Um, we will we'll be seeking to uh, employ uh, skilled workers. But also we'd like to be involved in uh, how we begin to train the workforce that we need. Um, and so um, we'll be looking at um, opportunities to engage with STEM programs at the high school level, but also at the community college level. Okay, and I apologize, this is my last question. Um, what will be the starting salary and or hourly wage? So we've, um, we've, um, computed an average hourly wage, um, or, or average annual wage of around 71,000 um, for our employees at the site. Um, we have um, made commitments um, previously publicly that we would um, offer our factory employees at least $25 an hour. Um, and so looking to, uh, these will be good jobs for, um, for the community. We are really excited about you coming to Oklahoma City, and I just personally want to thank you, but um, could you tell some of the listeners some of the fun facts about the vehicles, uh, range, capacity, size, um, number of riders, just tell us a little bit about the vehicles itself. Yeah, so um, we're very excited about what we've been able to do with, uh, with our vehicles. So often as, as we move to electric vehicles, you'll see uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle that's 
basically that old engine is taken out and you're placing in a new um, electric motor. It all looks the same. Um, no opportunity was taken to, uh, to really reimagine uh, how that vehicle can work. Um, we have taken that opportunity. And so our engineers have kind of thought if we were Henry Ford coming back uh, into the place where we are now, knowing what we know now, um, how would he approach um, automaking today? And so our engineers have really re-engineered uh, these vehicles from the ground up. Uh, we have developed um, a proprietary um, chassis for our vehicles that includes all of the key component parts, the batteries, the motors, um, of course the drivetrain, and that is separate from what goes on top of that vehicle. And we're employing uh, steer-by-wire technology that we've uh, adapted from aviation, and that means there's no steering column that's connected from the top of the vehicle to the chassis. And what that allows us to do and what that allows our customers to do is really um, have multiple options for what goes on top of that chassis. So if the chassis is um, engineered to go for hundreds of thousands of miles, um, but maybe you've bought a, um, a cool pickup truck on our chassis and you uh, decide later on you need a minivan. You can come back to us, um, we can take off that minivan or take off that pickup truck and put the minivan on top of it um, in about six hours, that change can be made. And so it offers a lot of opportunities for consumers um, and for our, our fleet customers. Uh, thank you and welcome to Oklahoma City. I think this is exciting. It's a, uh, a, uh, a very interesting uh, marketing concept and it, it creates its own market with the way you've uh, designed the vehicle. Uh, unlike, say, Tesla, I hate to bring up other companies, but uh, you provide so much more options in terms of, of your market. So uh, welcome and, and we wish you good luck. I would like to point this out. We're expecting uh, more than a five I mean, a five to one return from our investment from local uh, sales and property taxes. Unfortunately, not all of the investments made by this development trust of ours uh, is successful in that regard. So I'd like if we could get a report. Uh, of investments made by the Economic Development Trust, say over the past two to three years, comparing the expected return to the local economy for those investments that we're making. But this is a great example where manufacturing does provide, on average, nationally five to seven uh, times the amount of investment from uh, local government. So great story, helps us out helps us to help the citizens of Oklahoma City to find a uh, more productive uh, type of employment that uh, I think is going to be here for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to say welcome to Oklahoma City. Welcome to Ward 3. Super Thank excited you. about you coming. <laughs> um, you, you spoke a little bit about your partnerships with um, Votex, and I think I read it in here, but Canadian Valley and, and Francis Tuttle, you're pretty well going to be situated um, dead center between the two. So I look forward to anything I can do to help you guys um, progress with that. The kids are really important to me and having um, opportunities for them to stay in Oklahoma City um, and work at a good wage is, is very promising. So we look forward to having you. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to working with you on that. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> if I may just back up briefly, we had a resident who speak to, uh, signed up to speak on an item we'd already passed, but uh, we have Brittany Hunter here for AA and AB, the uh, assessment role items uh, regarding the Adventure District bid. Is Brittany here?
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so my name is Brittany Hunter, and I'm the executive director of the Oklahoma City Adventure District. And I, on behalf of my board and my bid members, would like to thank you all um, for your support and everything that we do and, and your continued support moving forward. So our goal for 2023 is to increase awareness. And you know, we've been around for forever, and a lot of people still don't know what the Adventure District is. And so we're excited to announce that we will be releasing a new logo in January 2023. In addition, we will also have a full calendar of events that will include participation of our large attractions, but a lot of our small businesses as well. Um, we are aware that we haven't been the most visible or reachable district, but under new leadership, we are committed to making the district a destination district full of attractions, restaurants, and hotels. I am available to be reached at director at oklahomacityadventure.com. And if, if I may, um, want to introduce Brittany to our, our council. This is her first uh, introduction as the executive director for the Adventure District. And we are very grateful uh, for her presence and the new vision that is being brought to the Adventure District. So uh, very grateful that you are here and um, clearly um, I knew this was on there, but I'm glad you're here to speak through it. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, if I may, uh, just to say welcome as, as well, um, feel free to reach out anytime to the Ward 2 office. Happy to sit down for coffee. Um, but Councilor, uh, Councilwoman Nice and I were just looking a few weeks ago at a very exciting project, this uh, Deep Fork Trail mm -hmm. that's going to connect. And I can't tell you how many times I have wanted to, instead of hopping on I-44 from where I live in the Paseo to drive to Tinseltown, which is my favorite place to watch a movie in this city. Those <laughs> daytime ticket costs, oh my gosh, yeah. just whoosh. <laughs> um, but I've wanted to ride my bike. And it is nearly impossible to bike mm -hmm. from the Northwest Corridor to um, the Adventure District. But with the new Deep Fort Trail, that's gonna make that like a dream come true for me. It is. So I know historically that 235 uh, interstate has been a barrier between Ward 2 and 7, but I really do want to think about ways that the historic commercial districts in Ward 2 can better connect, whether it's through that trail or the upcoming BRT um, that's coming to the east side. Um, so just know you all have a, a partner in Ward 2 for sure. Thank you so much. All right, have a great day. Right, thank you. Okay, now uh, taking things back in order, um, item BA, Councilwoman Hammond, you wanted to speak to that. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight this item. I know in the last few months I've had people ask me about different, up, you know, for updates on different MAPS 4 projects, one of them being our animal shelter. Um, and I said, I know things are moving, you know, but I don't have a, you know, something fun to announce, you know. So I just wanted to point out that that, that this is us receiving um, the consultant report for architectural or an architect firm um, to design the facility. Um, and then they're gonna start um, just author or negotiating a contract with them so that things are moving along um, with the animal shelter. So just wanted to pull that piece and highlight it because I think that's an exciting step in um, getting that thing into brick and mortar. All right. Well, that's all the items that uh, we had pulled out for any separate discussion on the consent docket. So we could take a, a motion now for to approve all items, save for the two that have already been approved. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to item 10, the concurrence docket. Uh, there is a presentation on item L. Yes, Kenny Sudel, the CEO of uh, the Alliance for Economic Development of Oklahoma City, will give a quick presentation on this project. This is actually a river, I mean, I'm sorry, a redevelopment authority project, but there's an agreement here between the Economic Development Trust and the Redevelopment Authority uh, to provide some additional funding as a temporary transfer. So I'll let Kenny go through that and explain it. Hey, good morning, Mayor and Council. Kenny Sudel with the Alliance. Just wanted to <clears throat> come and talk about this because this is really one piece of the story. Wanted to kind of give you the background and some more uh, of the information. Um, 
the Convergence Project, I think most of you are familiar with that, that's you know, really a linchpin of, of the Innovation District. And uh, there was originally a economic development agreement, it, just as you uh, to recall, that's in TIF number 11. And uh, TIF 11 is one of the TIFs that was managed by the Redevelopment Authority. Um, there was an economic development agreement through the Oklahoma City Redevelopment Authority, which is a trust of the city, with them to provide $13.7 million of uh, assistance in development financing for their project, which included an office tower, parking garage, hotel, and then the partnership with the city on Innovation Hall. You know, I think you, you've probably heard many say in this environment with the rising costs, uh, the, the inflation where it is, the interest costs going up, about every project I'm involved in is having increases, and this one's no different. Um, the total cost of the project, the estimated total cost, has increased by about $42 million from the last time that that, that deal was done. Um, they are moving ahead. That's a, a, a done by BT Development as the entity, but that's uh, Mark Beffert and Dick Tannenbaum. Um, they are putting significant dollars into the deal, um, but it got to the point where we had to take a look at this again to provide some additional incentives. So Redevelopment Authority will be uh, considering an item to raise that from 13.7 to 18.7 to provide an additional $5 million of incentives. On that side of it, there will be a minimum tax payment required that is sufficient to cover the entire incentive that's provided. Um, what this is doing is something similar to what cities done in the past when there's different city trusts to kind of help manage cash flow. This would be transferring $5 million from the Economic Development Trust to the Redevelopment Authority to help fund that incentive. Uh, as part of the agreement, at least 70% of the minimum tax payments on that deal would have to come back to Economic Development Trust until this is repaid. In addition, there are a couple of hurdles there or milestones that it, by December 2026, if Redevelopment Authority has not paid back at least $3 million, There'll be an additional $250,000 fee that goes back to the Economic Development Trust. And then there's a second milestone that in 2028, um, if the full amount has not been repaid, there would be an additional $250,000 fee. So again, this is <clears throat> all within the, um, uh, it will all be covered by the minimum tax payment that would be uh, imposed upon that project. Uh, the 70 percent also uh, was strategically done to make sure that some of the increment is still available for other uses in the innovation district, such as uh, the education committee or potentially other things like that. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I just want to kind of give you the whole story because this really just is the piece between Economic Development Trust and Redevelopment Authority. I, um, I got a couple questions, if you will, um, because I can, I'm sorry, it's very difficult to hear, it's muffled. Uh, so if you'll again repeat the part that pertains to uh, the education committee, and then um, I may have some questions, I will have some questions after that. Uh, on, as it relates to this, there's nothing directly in there, but I, what I was saying was the repayment, at least 70% of the increment will have to come back to the Economic Development Trust until this money has been repaid, but that was done strategically to leave at least 30% there, which will be more than $350,000 a year, which incidentally was the amount that we funded the uh, Education Committee last time. So trying to make sure that we just ensure there are funds there. There are also other funds, there are other projects and minimum tax payments in those TIF districts that provide funding for that as well, but we just wanted to ensure that we had some funding there and it wasn't all you know, used up for the first five or six years. Okay, so I want to clarify mm -hmm. that money will remain for the education committee because we've had this conversation a few times, so I wanna make sure publicly that we understand this money will remain for the education committee. It is my intent that that be so. Again, it has to be approved by the Redevelopment Authority, those allocations to the Education Committee, but that is my plan. That's the plan I'm putting forward to make sure that money's there for them. So as much as I can promise it, yes, but ultimately the Redevelopment Authority has to approve those allocations to the Education Committee. 
Okay, and I, I guess that's where my hesitancy comes into play because that was not uh, what this was designed to do to, to, for there to be a maybe. Um, there's always been the intent and shall for the education committee. Uh, so that part in particular um, makes me very uneasy uh, as far as this conversation that we're having uh, for any of our education committee members that continue to reach out to me because of this mm -hmm. concern. And now, as I had been reassured this would not happen, we're having a public conversation that says it's my intent. So well, which one are we going to do? Well, I'm, I'm just saying this is one source. There are other sources uh, in that TIF project plan that also can provide funds. There, this is not the only source. I'm just trying to say that we're designing this to ensure that at least this source is there. There are other sources there, and I'm making that commitment. I just wanted to be clear that I don't fully control that. You know, I put the I can bring forward a plan, but it's just the redevelopment authority board is who has to approve that plan. And, and while I totally understand that, um, again, these are the conversations that we have to have with the education committee, and even the knowledge and understanding of the education committee is that there is funding for them to do the work. Uh, for this, these STEM programs and STEAM programs for mm -hmm. the residents that, in our, especially our students that reside within Northeast Oklahoma City. So I, I want you to walk me through um, this convention center hotel as far as what I see from the, the four million of the OCEDT of what I'm reading. So the city, you know, can, the, Economic Development Trust slash the city can use different funds. What was chosen to use here was, if you'll recall, as part of the Omni plan, there were a basket of different revenue sources that went in to fund, repay the debt on the Omni uh, project. As part of that plan that was adopted by council and the Economic Development Trust, it laid out that if the funds collected got beyond two times the debt service necessary, then those funds could potentially be used for other purposes. So we're in that, in that boat right now where, you know, luckily we've had enough revenues collected from all those different sources that have gone into that, that there was some additional funds available that we could use for this purpose. But so the, if, the if we're using that amount of money, how much more money is left in this particular um, convention center hotel that we are able to use? Uh, I'd, we can get you that information. I don't have that right off the top of my head, but this money too, when repaid, would go right back into that bucket. Right. Thank you. And my, my, other, my other concern as we continue to look at how we are, um, in my opinion, giving out GOAT funds like candy, how uh, um, my concern is the fact that when we have these types of projects, and when we have new projects that come online, especially for um, smaller businesses that can't even get in the door to get gold funds, but yet we can do this all day long for other companies, that, that really is disheartening um, as much as we fight for these small businesses to stay afloat and to even figure out how to bring some of these smaller businesses online for our city to be able to thrive just as much as we're trying to bring all of these bigger companies in. Um, and so therefore, you know, I, that's where I have a problem. We just uh, approved GOAT for something else and now here we are for GOAT for this. Um, and the fact of the project itself and they came and gave a presentation about how they're going to be able to fund and do all of these things and now here we are asking for more money for them to be able to finish this project and, and that I have a problem with. Any other questions or comments on this item? I would actually like to vote separately on this item. I understand it has already been approved by the trust but I still want like to vote separately on this item. Okay, so the request is to vote on item L. Uh, we don't have a slip for you. There's one in there. There's one in there. So we have a request to it's vote separately on item L. And so if what somebody wants to make a motion for approval, we can do that. I've got a slip in there, man. Go ask it. We have a motion in a second. Cast your votes. Goddamn cracker. 
I'd like to vote nay. I can't pull my computer up. I'm sorry? I'd like to vote nay. Oh, okay. Oh, she. I have a slipper now, uh, Holt. I, I can't tell them what for them to bring it in here. Passes seven to one. And now we have the rest of the concurrence docket. We can uh, take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Uh, yes, please. Passes unanimously. All right, well, now we advance to item 11, items requiring separate votes. Uh, we have item A, this is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval at 215 Southeast 38th Street, going from R2 to R4. Um, I don't know if Councilman Stone spoke to anybody about, you got this? Okay, we Playing do have- the role of Todd Stone today, if that's okay. Okay, we do have Chris Griswold, who signed up to speak. Morning. Thanks for having me. Yes, I am uh, the uh, council representing the applicant on this rezoning application from R2 to R4 there uh, at the address of 218 Southeast 38th Street. I uh, was um, lucky enough to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission I'm at, uh, and to get their recommendation on this application. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is a rezone that is to permit multifamily residential development. Uh, on October 13th, the Planning Commission record approval. I'm aware of no one in opposition, so at this I'm time, not, I move for approval. Yes, yes, Mr. Stunsifer, I'm not aware of any objection either. All right, <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. Coming up. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, 11B is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval at 20990 Southeast 104th, going from AA to RA2. Uh, it's in Ward 4, but Councilman Stone Cipher, no one has signed up to speak. Sure. Um, this rezone is to permit rural residential development. Uh, on October 13, Planning Commission approved it. There is no, There are no protests that I'm aware of, so I'll move for approval at this time, please, of 11B. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11C is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 4617 East Avenue, going from R1 to R2. It's in Ward 4. Councilman Stone Cipher, no one has signed up to speak. I now understand why Todd went on vacation. <laughs> uh, this is a rezone to permit two family residential duplex usage. Um, it was approved by the Planning Commission. There are no protests that I'm aware of, so I'll move for the approval of item 11C at this time, please. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. And Councilwoman Nice, are you, having, are you unable to vote still? I am now. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Passes unanimously. 11D is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 218 Southeast 70th, going from R1 to R2. It's in Ward 4. Councilman Stone Cipher, no one has signed up to speak. Again, this is also a rezone to permit two family uh, residential duplexes. It was approved by Planning Commission. I'm aware of no protests, so at this time, please, I'd move for approval of 11D. Motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11E was previously deferred, which brings us to 11F, an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 7101 South Indian Meridian, going from AA to PUD 1905. It's in Ward 4. Councilman Stone, Cypher, no one has signed up to speak. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, receiving a text from uh, Todd, he um, would like to review this some more, and so uh, I'm going to move to divert, defer this to the next meeting. Okay. And what's the date of that, please? The 20th. December 20th. Thank you. All right, so the motion is to defer item 11F.
until the meeting in two weeks. We have a motion and a second. Uh, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item is deferred. All right, 11G, ordinance on final hearing that is recommended for approval at 4901 North I-35 Service Road going from PUD 313 and HNO to PUD 1914. Uh, Councilwoman Nice, one resident, has signed up to speak. Okay. Um, the purpose of this is to request a uh, equestrian facility and veterinarian and commercial and industrial uses. And um, this is in proximity to the Remington Park area of our city. So um, I will ask that we, and a new vet cl clinic is needed in our community. So I will ask that we hear from the resident. Okay. And this is not the applicant, so it may be that the applicant wants to speak after that probably if they're here, but uh, Michael Washington. Yeah. Okay, now I'm just learning about this. Oh yeah, 3501 Northwest 1st Street, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73112. I'm just now learning about this process here. I think I'm gonna start getting a little bit more uh, aware about what's going on in the city council. I've been rather busy with a number of things, but uh, again, this is just uh, all of a sudden off the chart here. Okay, Northwest I-35 service road from P2, PD 313 plan unit development. Okay, and this is supposed to be by Remington Park. Now I'm trying to see who benefits from this. This is what I'm trying to get at. I didn't get an opportunity to really just investigate it like I want to and to really give it the kind of discussion that I need. However, I will take this time to say that I will be investigating a little bit more. I think we maybe need to need to hold this off again. Councilwoman just stated that this is needed here, so we definitely give that some kind of slight uh, uh, importance. But again, uh, we notice that every time we turn around here, houses are being torn down in favor of businesses and black folks are being moved out in favor of Caucasian people, again, I have no, don't, don't give me wrong, I have no problem with anyone, but at the same time, don't discriminate and deliberately take action to deprive people of their homes that they've been living in all their lives for the sake of discrimination practices and purposes. That is very wrong. Everybody knows that. So again, I'm going to take a little bit more time. Now, this is not the final approval of that, is it, Councilwoman? This is not the final approval, that is. Oh, it is? Okay, so yeah, I may, maybe take a little bit of uh, time on that. So I think, again, I don't know, it's going to be right there by, look like, now where's Remington Park from now? Okay, it'll be over there. So, I don't know, it's probably going to be approved anyway. Again, that's really probably not a problem, but I just want to let everybody know I want to make a statement. Oh, on 50th. Okay, right on 50th. That'll be right in that area. If you oh. look, if, let me help you with this. If you look at the screen um, right where you see the subject area of this, on the other side is Northeast 50th. And to in my left of the picture that you're looking at is the cowboy uh, is a softball uh, museum, and to the left of that is going to be Remington Park area. Oh, okay, yeah, I've seen that. I'm, I, like I said, I will. And, take it. and also want to reemphasize to your question, and then um, I'm going to allow Mr. Box to speak to your concerns that this particular area there is nothing presently there. Uh, so this, this is nothing is being torn down in That's order for I mean. anything else to be built. So trust me, I, I understand your concerns and that is also a concern of mine as we uh, look at how uh, parts of our community are, are being developed. Oh, okay, that's what I was really concerned about. All right, yes, that sounds like a good one then. Okay, well, we can probably look at that further. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Box, if you would, uh, the question was asked, uh, who will benefit from these uses? So if you can help us to explain and answer those questions, I would be very grateful for that. Sure, David Box, 522 Callcore Drive. Um, I think who will benefit would be the general public, as well as you know the, the synergy that could exist with Remington Park. Uh, there are no large animal vet clinics in this area that I'm aware of. Uh, with everything going on in this area, it was believed by staff and, and by planning commission that this was compatible and perhaps uh, a nice addition to the area. So we did work with staff and the planning commission extensively on the PUD to ensure that we had a product that was compatible with the conference of plan in the area. Ultimately, staff did recommend approval uh, as well as planning commission. Thank you for that. And um, uh, upon us 
voting for this, I would like to talk to you through this. Maybe you can connect me to whoever the, the clinic will be housed under so I can work with them to figure out how we can make sure our community is a part of this veterinary clinic. And I will also emphasize again, we do not have a veterinary clinic in Northeast Oklahoma City. So this is the first opportunity for us to have that. Um, and especially with the opportunity now to uh, be able to serve our larger equestrian uh, animals. And if you think about the Spencer Green Pasture area, that is where we have a lot of cowboys, cowgirls, and a lot of horses, and a lot of cattle, all of those types of animals that can be serviced right in our community. So with that, I will move for approval. Got a motion and a second <coughs> coming up. <clears throat> Cast your votes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right, item 11H is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 3916 Northwest 164th going from PUD 706 to PUD 1916, Councilman Stonecipher. Yeah, uh, Mr. Box, uh, I meant to come and talk to you this morning and didn't. I have a couple of questions that came up on this. Would it be all right if I deferred this to the 20th? Um, to December 20th. Can we put it to the heel of the zoning cases? Let me text my client. That one of the problems is there are building permits already issued. All the dirt was already moved and they are mobilized on site. Okay, can we just put it to the hill of the docket and let me visit with him for a second? Sure, okay, so we'll hold right. item H for a moment. Uh, 11I is an ordinance on final hearing rec that was recommended for approval at 1900 Northwest 10th going from R2 to SPUD 1447, Councilwoman okay. Hammond. Yeah, um, this is a uh, property over on 10th Street um, to be rezoned for multifamily development um, and I will move for approval. Okay. All right, here we go. Got a motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, uh, item 11J is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 500 Northwest 31st, going from R2 to SPUD 1449, Councilman Cooper. They have not. Uh, there we go. Yes, okay, thank you. Then all is well, Councilwoman. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think this will be a good project, especially with some street enhancements uh, coming to Walker over the next uh, year in terms of pedestrian improvements. And I think that the folk who will be able to take advantage of this sort of housing will find such improvements useful. So I will move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, uh, item 11K is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 1500 Northeast 9th, going from R2 to SPD 1450. Uh, Councilwoman Nice, we do have a resident who has signed up to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, I will say the purpose of this is to permit a fourplex and in its place there is an existing building. So we are not tearing anything down. We are just using the 
same structure in order to accommodate a fourplex uh, for this particular part of our community uh, that is compatible with the uses that are around it, uh, which is all R2. And uh, I do want to mention the TEs that our sidewalks shall be repaired or replaced as necessary to meet the public works standard. And um, is, that's very important for this particular area of our community. Um, but with that, I will ask that we hear from the citizen. A resident, excuse me. Uh, Michael Washington. Thank you all again, thank you, thank you here. I was asked to come down here this afternoon, actually, this morning actually. Well now, this here seems to me the start of a bigger project where more and more units are going to be built in, even though you, you say they're not going to be places immediately uh, targeted for closure or anything, or uh, to be closed down or whatever the case is. Now this is going to be in a spot you said it's already opened up, I understand that, but now does this open the door for other units to come in that area? So we're talking about a low income, quote on medium income, low density residential area, houses being moved. I mean, so after all, does this mean that maybe 10 and 11 houses that are there, maybe two will be left for units? This is what I'm trying to get at here. I mean, you know, what is the purpose for that being there? You know, I don't understand that. You know, to move house. So in other words, are we somewhere outside that we're not bringing up here, moving people from wherever the other case in the city to move in that area there? Because we know in that area by itself, it's not going to just be for those people since they already have homes. So is there a plot somewhere else to bring those people wherever they're living outside the district to bring them in there on that unit that we're talking about? That's what I'm kind of concerned with right there. Um, I'm gonna have to look at that as well. Now, Ms. Nice, you can maybe help me out with that. You said that uh, there's not gonna be anything torn down. But it's going to be, look at this here. Street from, from, R2, medium, low density residential district, to simplify plan unit development district. So plan development means that that's not going to be one, but the plan development means they're going to be more and more and more come seeing they're still just in one unit. Am I making sense here? I mean, it seems like. No, you're not making sense. Well, talk to me. So let me right. explain. Uh, Ms. Cindy, will you pull up that other picture for me, please? Thank you so much. If you look at the picture that is in front of you, um, as you see that subject area, R2 basically means that you can have anything that is not single family homes, mm -hmm. which also means that in this area we have duplexes. So what this particular home is and has had been previously was a duplex. So what they are now doing is converting this duplex into a fourplex. Oh, okay, so extended, okay. okay. And again, nothing will be lost, and if anyone ever wanted to build a duplex or uh, something to that magnitude in this same block of area that you see, they can because it's already zoned R2, and that would not have to come to this council to be voted upon because they already have the opportunity to do that. Okay, okay, thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I, I, I'm kind of got a clear vision on it now. All right, so the jury's out on this one at this point. Yeah, but again, that's a good explanation there. Again, so. And what we can do uh, is possibly get you in contact with Mr. Box so you can get with the applicant itself and find out how, if there's an opportunity to figure out how we can get our, our community or residents um, housed. If there's an opportunity to do that, he'll be able to, to make sure you have a communication with someone that can assist in that effort. That's a good point. Okay. Thank you all so much. I think I'll handle it right now. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I will move for approval. All right. This is motion and a second for item K. Cast your votes. Mayor, I'm not able to vote via electronically, but I would say yes. Okay. Passes unanimously. 
All right, item L is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 5101 North Pennsylvania, going from R1, PUD 1715 and PUD 1351 to SPUD 1453. Uh, Councilman Cooper. Uh, has someone signed up to speak other than my no. invite to Mr. Box? They have not. Okay. Uh, David Box 522, Call Core Drive. So this is a, uh, the, the most recent uh, application you've heard on the Oak development. Uh, if you've driven by there, you've seen that the Oak development is well underway. Uh, most of the utilities are, are being moved uh, and or are in place. This uh, sliver was part of a closing application that you heard, um, I think, a couple months ago. And typically when you have a piece like this, the subject property would have just reverted to the adjacent zoning, which would have been the, the PUD uh, for the Oak. Based upon the manner in which this uh, piece of land was originally conveyed to the Department of Transportation, there was a limitation on uh, the zoning. And so we had to come back and rezone that tiny little sliver uh, because of what you see there. You can see how uh, two buildings actually touch this, this track. So what we've done is match the regulations contained in the master PUD uh, so that there will be a cohesive development. Planning Commission recommended approval, no technical evaluations. And Councilman Cooper, we may actually have someone who sent it to speak. There's a little bit of confusion about which item, but uh, I think Thuy Farrell? Yes. Are you here for this item? Okay. All right. Okay. I don't, do you want to hear from her Let's now? Let's go. Okay. Um, uh, my name is uh, Thuy Farrell. I'm an advocate for homeowners and uh, citizens living around the Oak Development at the corner of Northwest Expressway in Pennsylvania. There is a proposal for the easement where there is uh, our homeowners. Um, they are not so much opposing the progress or the development. Um, what we are here uh, to do is to tell the stories of uh, homeowners, uh, senior citizens, and namely the two people that I am advocating for uh, who are Vietnamese. They had, uh, through all this time, not been uh, properly communicated in their own language. I had just been aware of the situation where um, their house is butts up right to the, uh, the oak development. And every morning, every day, they are um, faced with uh, noise pollution, dust pollution, uh, the earth uh, ground shaking around. Um, if you would please try to imagine the homeowners as senior citizens, and they are not giving a lot of options. What Oak uh, Veritas has offered them was is such low ball figures of 128,000 or $168,000 for their properties to move. Nowhere in Oklahoma City can they properly buy um, homes for which they would have to take out a second mortgage. And that is what we have uh, told uh, Mr. Ryan McNeil, is that these lowball figures will never allow these citizens to live uh, the quality of life that they have worked their whole lives to do. Their whole lives, this was their home that they were going to live and die and have raised their uh, family for the last 20 to 30 years. The figures that we have given um, that they are asked uh, to, to settle on is $168,000. When my um, uh, friends um, have tried to buy a home in the same uh, zip code, which is 73112, the prices go from uh, 300 uh, or 400 thousand dollars and with uh, any kind of um, means for them to get a second uh, to get a loan um, the senior citizens are on fixed income um, they are not opposed to the development or the easement what they're opposed to 
is the uh, lack of care and concern that Veritas has shown because uh, the only thing uh, that Veritas will say or Oak Development have said to them is, do you know what your clients uh, paid for the house in 1990, which is $28,000? We said, well, that really doesn't apply to this year, to the current uh, value and uh, inflation. What we would like for the commission to consider is the current sale of the car wash um, of half an acre at $2.2 million, which averages out to about $127 a square foot. Applying that to the lot uh, of $6,000, we would be looking at about $600,000, where we would not be that unreasonable. We would like the uh, commission to please compel Veritas to um, come up with a more reasonable uh, way to uh, help the senior citizens, because in that whole area, there are many uh, diverse group, but many of them are senior citizens on fixed income, so we cannot apply the standard of what they purchased the house in 1990 or paid for the house 20 or 30 years ago. We need, uh, we'd like the committee to um, create a commission or a little committee to study what, uh, what the needs of the uh, homeowners are and to get them to be made whole in the move for those who are uh, wanting to, which a lot of my um, friends, if they would come up here, please. Um, these are the homeowners of that whole um, block of, of homeowners. Uh, and we, um, these are all senior citizens on fixed income and have not been able to voice um, their concerns um, this is Mr. and Mrs. Van, uh, who have never even known about the process for which they can oppose um, the easement. This is the first time um, that they uh, ha have been have the paperwork and everything have been translated to them. Um, they were offered very low amount just this year, and they told the um, Mr. McNeil that there is no way that they can sell this house for 168 and go out and buy a house uh, for which they would not have a mortgage. This is Mr. and Mrs. Van, whose house is, uh, has a whole um, advertisement of, of oak development right plastered um, at the fence uh, that butts up to their home. Um, I always would also like to um, introduce uh, Carol Kimes. Would you come up here? Yeah, I was not prepared to speak today, but um, this is just one of many little um, easements that they keep asking for, and they um, keep encroaching in our area, which is fine. If you're young, you can maybe get a loan and, and uh, progress ahead. But what's happening is um, if you look at uh, the location of the homes that we're talking about, it's 50th all the way down to Young's Boulevard. And I have to concur that these guys wake up every morning with clunking and stuff going on and uh, because we can hear it a block away. So if we can hear it a block away, I don't know how they're living with all of this. And if you see their home, they've planned it many years ago to be senior um, built, you know, and that sort of thing. So to go ahead and not just buy another house, but find a house that is senior um, designed for them to take baths and all the, all the things that you have to do. And if you saw their home now, it's fabulous for seniors. And they did this many years ago, put a lot of money into it before they started this whole project. So anyway, I plead that we moved, myself, we moved into here, this neighborhood to um, enjoy what they have <laughs> and also be on our, we're on a fixed income now too, 10 years later. But um, it, it's just one of many things, and it's, it's getting to where it be where we can't trust what they say. And this easement that you're talking about definitely needs to be done, and you know we concur with that. But we'd uh, like to have maybe some time. I don't know if you'd have an appointment for us to visit with you again. We'd like to come back and maybe have more information for you. Um, 
I see the oak as a good development for the city. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Forgive me. One person signed up to speak. Okay. You're welcome to speak, but what I need is your representatives. I need to know who you are, your address. That would be very helpful. But I, I only have one person, and the, the public who's watching this needs for the public record to know who is speaking, these sorts of things. So you're welcome to do so, but would you mind first name, last name, home address, please? I apologize. This is our first That's okay. time. okay. Thank you. Go ahead and state your Hi. name, Tom. I am Tom McGivney. My current residence is 2233 Northwest 50th. Uh, I am not opposed to the oak. I think it's a wonderful development for the city. The problem is the people that live in the area have not been treated properly. In the beginning, they came to us. We were fully informed of what was going on. And um, after that, it's been a blank. We have to call them to try and find out I wake up every morning with dump trucks coming down 50th Street. Huge trucks. Huge <laughs> dump trucks and everything else. Um, now, all of a sudden, they're, in their initial presentation, there was no notification of this car wash being bought or their original area being expanded. I cannot basically have somebody come and look at my house when there's trucks driving around. We become a construction area. My opposition is to how the Verentis, Ver, Veritas, I'm sorry, organization is taking care of the people or not taking care of the people as they proceed with their construction. I think there's a lack of attention to the current citizens of your city. Uh, this is Sandy McGiven, also at the same address, the spouse of Mr. Tom McGiven. I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> um, I have uh, spent a lot of time with them, and I think they, the concern is the, the treatment of the uh, homeowners and residents. Um, and we're asking you to please compel Veritas to study what a fair market value is uh, and using the standard that they have published and paid for at the car wash of $127 a square foot as a possible standard uh, for uh, buying the, these uh, homeowners out, which they are willing to sell, but it has to be fair, equitable, and to make them whole and not to lower their standard of living that they have worked their entire lives for. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking. Um, first, well, I have two people. I have some questions, maybe three. Uh, but first, uh, if we could hear from uh, the applicant's representative, would you mind speaking to, I think specifically my first question is the, when I hear a resident talk about the language barrier, you know, Ward 2 being, as you know, home to our city's historic Asian district with a pretty significant Asian, uh, excuse me, um, Vietnamese population and Vietnamese speaking population. I, like to kind of hear a little bit more context, if you wouldn't mind, um, on that, and then anything yeah. else to which you'd like to respond. Um, so, my belief is that more public engagement happened on this project um, than any project I've been involved in over the last 15 years. Mr. McNeil and his development team started having public charrettes back in 2016 uh, on this project. There were a host of covenants that encumbered this property that required sign off to revise the covenants by the neighbors. There were multiple public meetings held with the neighbors to discuss the project, to discuss the covenants. Um, there were multiple payments made to neighbors uh, to um, get them comfortable with revising the covenants. Uh, multiple lawsuits were filed to revise those covenants all the time. 
we were having public meetings um, that uh, I, I know Ms. Powers went to several. I'm not sure if, if, if you did, Councilman. Um, but there was significant public involvement. Um, and then in addition, of course, there's been uh, the rezoning application on the main PUD that went through Planning Commission City Council. There was a rezoning application on the western piece after an engineering issue was discovered that went through Planning Commission City Council. There have been at least four closing applications that went through Planning Commission and City Council. Um, the, the folks that spoke kept referencing an easement, so there's actually two applications. There's an easement closing that's not before you today that I think is what they were here on. That's along Northeast, excuse me, Northwest 50th Street. Uh, we are closing and vacating uh, a portion of utility easement that no longer has any utilities in it because we have moved all of the utilities as part of this development project. Uh, we are sympathetic to the idea that living next to a construction site would be problematic. One of the ways we're trying to um, avoid longer term problems is you'll notice that 50th Street right now is closed. In an effort to get as much of the infrastructure done as possible, we've worked with Eric Winger to try to get all of this done so that once 50th Street reopens, it's just reopened, rather than doing 50th and then closing it as new buildings come online. So we are trying to do this in a manner that is as quick as possible, uh, understanding that living next to a construction site will uh, at times provide um, problems. In terms of the sale of the red carpet car wash that, that my client bought, of course that is a commercial tract at the hard corner of Northwest Highway in Pennsylvania. Um, to try to apply $127 a square foot to a commercial sale uh, to a single family home that is, is in a neighborhood, I'm not sure this is the forum to try to negotiate uh, the sale of their home. Um, Mr. McNeil has purchased several homes in the area, and I'm, if, if he's interested in that, I'm, I can give them uh, his contact inf information and, and put, that, uh, put them in a room together. It was before the council now is, is that little tiny sliver uh, of land at Northwest Highway and Penn that we're seeking to put into a spud that would match PUD 1715, uh, which was a heavily negotiated uh, PUD with lots of public involvement. Um, there was protest at that council, but I think it was limited to Simon at the time that it came through. Uh, so what's before you is just that sliver. You, you, if you see that screen, you see the CE988 that was a closing application along 50th. There is uh, another application working its way through the process that goes west from there uh, that we are seeking to close because we have moved all the utilities out of there and are now relocated uh, as approved by Public Works and Utility Department within the balance of PUD 1715. So is it my understanding and my memory, because I took office in 2019, so I wouldn't have been there when these public meetups would have happened in 2016, 17, 18, but come 19, as you recall, this was one of the first items that came to council to rezone the entire thing. I believe there was an, a couple hours worth of a public debate because Penn Square Mall, their representatives were here. Yeah. Simon Properties were here. I mentioned this backstory to say that, am, am I understanding the, would you go back to the previous screen, the, uh, the notification? This would have gone out something like this back in 2019, right? To the residents within the 300 foot radius? Correct, it would have been much bigger because it would have encompassed the, whole the balance of 1715. And, I, and to your point, this has happened at least three more times where some sort of notification has gone out to the residents within that 300 foot radius? My belief is uh, at least eight, excuse me, 16, because I can count at least eight separate cases there would have been a notice for not only planning commission, but also city council. So I mentioned this just to say that I wanna make very clear on a public record, notification has gone out multiple times and there has been opportunities for residents to come speak before this body. I very vividly remember at least a two hour back and forth between Penn Square Mall right here in this room. Um, so, I, I, I would not want anyone to leave today believing they did not have an opportunity to speak multiple times at planning commission and then here before the council. 
But I do have one still remaining concern, and I think this might be a city manager uh, question. Maybe it's legal. Um, because again, with Ward 2 having the Asian district, um, I think in terms of notification, do, have, do we have any precedent? What happens for our residents who are Spanish speakers, Vietnamese speakers? Like I, by the way, let me also just say this about the 300 foot radius and correct the record if I'm wrong, some of the council members with longer memories might know this. It wasn't until maybe Ward four years ago, Pete White made that a thing where we started notifying people within a 300 foot radius? State law? Okay, when did that start? Do you remember? But that wasn't an always and forever thing. So we have that now. What about our Spanish speaking and Vietnamese residents uh, and other languages too, right? Uh, because even within the Asian district, it's not just Vietnamese, it's Laotian, Japanese, Chinese, et cetera. What, are, what have we done historically and what are options going forward for us to maybe think about when someone receives these notifications in the mail that if it's in English for them to be able to say, okay, got it, but how can I get this? So I'm gonna let JJ correct me if I'm wrong on this, but, but I think what we typically do, it's kind of like with our, some of our meetings and things, but if we get noticed that someone, you know, if we find out that someone needs help with interpretation of a notice that we send out, I think we try to deal with those as, as we get notification of that. We don't actually provide the notice in those other languages directly, but we try to respond as, we, as someone reaches out, which I know can be a challenge. But. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's taken on a case-by-case -case basis, and, the, and the, if someone calls and needs an interpreter, the city has a list of uh, multiple language-speaking employees that we can call on uh, for interpreter. Now, does it say that on, the, on this document? I don't know if it says that. It, it does have all of our phone numbers and, and the ability to reach us. A request, if I may then, going forward, and I think if nothing else comes out of this conversation, I'd like for us to maybe look at, I'm just thinking when I travel to other cities and I see a more dense, uh, densely populated part of town where it's gonna have folk whose migrant stories are many, right? Um, I'd like to learn from how those other cities handle these sorts of moments. I'm thinking in New York when you go into Queens, et cetera, it's just you know people from everywhere. Um, I'd like to know what that looks like. I mean, my guess is we have an option to maybe just put simple language on there that says for an interpreter, but I don't know, and I'm thinking legal would have to help us out there. So I do think that's something that I, no, I think I would like more on that. Council person, if, if I may. Um, also, in that lens, and I apologize uh, for being a part of this conversation, but when you go, I know traveling to other cities and even just traveling to Edmond, <laughs> if you look at their notices, they have them sitting on the property itself mm. for that notice uh, to be, there will be a hearing about this, please come. Um, so there are definitely opportunities. I know in Atlanta, there's also one uh, that they do that where the residents in the neighborhood actually knows because they see that there is going to be a physical zoning change or request to said property. Um, but in the lens of, of what you were saying as far as that language, is there a possibility of at just adding to the notice at the bottom um, if you need in other languages, if you need um, assistance in another language, please contact said number for our city in order for us not to have to change that. And, and to the point of these notices, I think we've all had experience where either there had been some type of miscommunication to the residents or you have residents that don't understand what they're looking at and what they're reading because, you know, here we are, uh, some of us, I mean, sometimes I get mail, I'm like, what is this supposed to really say? Instead of actually what it says. You know, there's always extra language that it's like, okay, th it's not as plain as it should be in order for folks to really understand this is what is about to take place. So there are definitely barriers when it comes to just your average resident sometimes reading stuff that comes from, from the city or from any other government entity, if you will, uh, about what, what the communication is uh, being said for them to understand or to respond to. 
right right now i can tell you i'm looking at the notice for this particular case the notice says in english for information call the number and there was be no reason you couldn't add put that in spanish too right under the english version of it you wouldn't even you don't have to change an ordinance or anything for that we could put put that in other languages yeah. because of the fact that we could deal with so many different languages we would probably leave it in a way that's a general statement but but let us explore that and just see what options there are good yeah. good oh, thank you both for that uh may i stick with uh kenny and uh, so i think i have two more questions here uh one is i believe i already know the answer to this i suspect some of the residents are not going to like what they hear but i'm just going to ask you heard their request in terms of compensation. Can this body, the council, do anything in terms of compelling, which was the word I heard, compelling a private entity to uh, negotiate or renegotiate um, or pay really anything? I, I want to hear, this is our legal representative for the city. I don't want to give you my opinion. I'm going straight to the lawyer's mouth. No, the city can't do anything about that. We can't force a private owner to to buy property from other private owners. So, and I, I say that as a for oh, people please. who maybe don't think about this stuff oh, on sure. a daily basis and might conflate it with things the city does or the government does. The developer is not exercising them in a domain. Mm -hmm. The develop they have every right not to sell, and so I think that's important for everybody to understand. No, I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, let me also just say, if you've never heard my philosophy when it comes to civics, um, so my, I see my role when I look at the words on both sides of this building about the perpetuation of good government, right? Um, I see my role as how do I invest in the, from the public sector, the infrastructure that then gives way to a resident or a business owner to developing along where we built the sidewalks, the bike lanes, the public transportation, the parks, right? That that's from the public sector, those investments could then spur private sector growth, right? But I'm not the private sector and I can't, I can't make them do the things. Now to an earlier conversation though that I heard about um, when, and to the mayor's point, when the city does do economic development deals with the business, I do wish the city had a better history and I look forward to being part of its future here, but I do wish we had a better history of incentivizing small businesses rather than the bigger ones, but that's for a different, different day, different conversation. Uh, so that's just kind of my own personal uh, economic and um, civic philosophy there. So. I would say if y'all have those conversations, those needs, that really is something to talk with the applicant's representative here, Mr. Box. I also understand that there's some trust that's, from what I heard you say, broken. I can't force him to tell you the truth or I can't force him to lie to you, but he is here for you to have a conversation. Um, you, you have a question? So again, the, I, I hear that right now you have the applicant's representative right here in front of you. Talk to them. We as a body, what I am committed to doing, and you heard the city manager as well, is how can we improve that language conversation on this notification? I also really like what Councilwoman Hammond has said about when a development 
or even a rezoning of a home to a different type of zoning, putting that uh, notification on the property so that residents, as they see something is coming and changing, they have that opportunity um, to engage. I think that's a wonderful idea. But I also have some bad news for you all, and this is actually an existential conversation that City Manager Freeman and I have all the time. When I ran for office, I knocked 4,000 doors, talked to 2,000 people. 2,500 people voted for me. That's not a bragging, because let me tell you this, 85,000 people live in Ward 2. 50,000 are registered. I would love what you just said for more people to, when they see a notification in the mail, whether it's to go to a zoning meeting or when I say I'm having a meetup in Ward 2 to talk about Ward 2 issues, I wish 50,000 people would show up. This was literally a conversation City Manager Freeman and I had just last week of me trying to find more ways to get residents engaged in. And there are a lot of things. I don't know all the reasons why people don't engage. There can be so many times we can send out things and people just don't listen to it. Um, or, uh, or people don't want to. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's an existential thing that I've never been able to quite wrap my head around, but it's something I'm committed to doing more. I'm knocking doors right now again, right? I'm always gonna try and get people um, engaged in this process. So we'll look at these two things when it comes to language, to see what we can do about getting stuff on buildings, just in summary there. Um, but, and, and again, we can't compel, I just want to, uh, again, on the issue of, of cost, can't compel that. Please talk to Mr. Box. One more thing, city manager. The email, I saw some of your emails about the noise and stuff, and I had my chief of staff, Boyd, look into that. Can we get maybe an update to folk about like what time the the construction when when during the start of the day can the wheels start turning and that sort of stuff? Um, we can get that information back to you. But I know garbage and stuff they start picking up at like six a.m. something like this. Right. And, and Kenny had an update too. He had had sure. some information like code enforcement has been out there. Yeah, I Check had code this. enforcement go out. Boyd and I actually after we got your email. And that's another thing I want you to know. You're, when you reach out to me, it does not fall on deaf ears. I'm, do, I mean, I'm teaching full time, but then I'm reading what you're saying. And on just Friday, we had Boyd, our chief of staff, go out, have someone go out and look at this. What's our update? That was a fast switch there. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, your update is, uh, this is according to Chad in code enforcement that they, they went out there and inspected and didn't find any code violations. So uh, you'd have to get more details from him. And then we'll, we'll keep sending, if y'all have specific times of the day or places you're wanting code enforcement right up here right now. Um, well, JJ, so you could talk to JJ about specific times that you're wanting people to go, the city to go put some eyes out there for accountability, happy to do that. Um, Absolutely. Now, those are the things I heard. I, I need to go ahead and move forward with this easement thing. But again, your avenue is right here with the applicant's representative. Your other avenue is right here with code enforcement. Um, we'll look into the zoning uh, uh, updating stuff. And that's where I'm at. Am I missing something? It, it, I, I, by the way, it's hard for someone to sit back there and not be at the mic and to make sure the public who's watching this at home can actually hear what you're saying. May I say one thing? One thing. I want to thank the city council for recognizing <clears throat> our issues that we have just talked about and taking action <clears throat> where it's appropriate for them. I want to thank you. I appreciate that. And we say one, well, go, go ahead first and I'll respond. I share the same concern as this gentleman regarding the planning and zoning of um, our great city. Um, more and more, these condominiums and uh, parks are, are geared and uh, towards um, wealthy young people who are going to be renting. Um, and whereas the Vietnamese people, we do not like rent. We want to own homes. 
So my concern is always with um, where are people going to live and buy affordable housings when we continue to approve these plans to build condominiums uh, for people to rent to uh, rather than home ownership around that area. My clients and friends have were at one time able to buy a home for $28,000 um, two income with no college degrees, uh, working at Tinker, they can afford to raise a family uh, with that kind of housing. And here we are trying to tear down neighborhoods uh, for the sake of a uh, very elite group of uh, young yuppies who are going to come in from other states these are residents of uh, 30, 40, 50 years. The Vietnamese will be uh, celebrating 50 years of the fall of Saigon, and we're slowly waking up to no home, home ownership. Uh, we do not want to rent because that's, we all know, is money down the drain, money poorly spent. The city is going to make $137 million as projected by Oaks. So what, what is that going to do for low-income, middle-class people who don't have a college degree? Where do they go? Are they going to go to the village? The village is getting to be unaffordable. Nichols Hills is getting to be unaffordable. We're getting so a little. We were, pre, we were already pretty far afield of, uh, of the item on the docket today. I think okay. we need to kind of I'm sorry. Wrap it I just up. had to <laughs> make that, that case for the people yeah. that I advocate Again, for. Again, we, we're not the developers, you know? Like, I mean, these are market decisions that they're going to make. Uh, we do have one more resident who signed up to speak Michael Washington. Go for it. Okay, not to take you long. I don't have but three minutes. This wonderful group of people have been well established for many years in a district that they decided to call their homes. They didn't just pick something out and say, I'm going to move here today and leave next week. They obviously felt it necessary that they found and firmly planted their feet on a solid foundation from which to live and maybe grow old and to end their lives there. Let me say this. That being the case, a lot of them don't have the type of representation that this developer has today. And quite naturally, you're not going to get the kind of communications or even legal terms and jargon stated to them that they can understand in which, OK, we have a level playing field right now. I am the law. You're not. So we basically can bulldog you and do what we want, in a sense. Not saying anything derogatory to this gentleman, and he's never done anything to me. However, he just stated earlier that he'd be willing to talk to the developer to, in further negotiations of possibly adding and increasing monies to those people who may want to leave their common wealth, their common homes. That being the case, and again, the mayor just admitted this is not an eminent domain thing. I would suggest them collaborating together, getting their monies together, and filing a lawsuit to prevent stopping or developing this uh, condominium in this shopping mall or whatever the case is. Yes, you can, and I will definitely and, and quickly help them file that lawsuit free of charge because I love doing legal work, as everybody knows. You better believe that. But again, the gentleman to my right just stated that he would be willing to further talk to the developer and see if he can't give them more money to justify them moving and leaving their houses from the law of construction and things that are going to be going on as this process complete, is completed, which will probably be completed probably about, what, a year, year and a half? So then think about how much trauma they're going to be having to wake up to every morning and, and when they go to sleep. This is something that needs to be talked about, $168,000. Man, $168,000 home, now you can't buy them anymore. And guess what? When that condominium do come into that neighborhood, that means the houses anytime you're going to buy are going to go up now. They want to get it for a little or nothing and then sell it to their higher ups, moving these people out. You see, taking that money and developing something, but that's how, isn't that how enterprise works? It's all about people moving out, the little people, so the big people come in. Like she just stated, the condominiums. Okay, not only do we want the condominiums, we want everybody out of our way. 30 to seconds, that area. please. We want everybody in that area out of our way because then we're going to put our neighborhood the way we want to put it. So now we're not going to tolerate that, though. So again, they don't have the kind of representation, so they get bulldogged. 
we're willing to make a move that's necessary to prevent this atrocity from happening. And you better be, let's believe you will, these people are citizens, American citizens, and we'll be given the respect that's due to everyone. Thank you all very much. One more thing. So the reason why it's easy for me to hear the residents' concerns today, and again, I appreciate you taking time to be here, is my mother turns 79 next month. She's a retired dialysis registered nurse. As you heard me say just two weeks ago during a homelessness debate, my mother has lived on social security disability since I was 11 years old. My father was an alcoholic who drank all of our money away. I know what it's like to live on a fixed income. I'm not rich. I don't come from a rich family. I didn't go to the private schools. When I won, it was a bit of a shock for that reason, okay? So I, I take, when I hear some people make these sort of arguments, like I'm some sort of well-connected uh, to the elite rich class, that's it, that, that is, that breaks my heart because I know what it's like for my mom who still lives on that, that disability check. And anyone who has watched me for four years on this horseshoe knows that the issues you've raised, ma'am, about a housing affordability and generational wealth, I have been a broken record on this horseshoe on those issues to the point where I annoy some of these people sometimes up here. He's smirking because he knows it's true. <laughs> so if you're looking for a partner to address attainable, affordable housing, you have one right here in Ward 2. I'm not interested in building luxury homes. But I also don't control the private sector. And so there's always going to be that market stuff. So if you want to partner in this, I have two things I want to throw at you. One, the next bond election will happen in 2026, 27. We do them every 10 years. It's the only chance we get to address our city's infrastructure, as you know, outside of maps. Bell Owl Library right down the street from you all is an example of that. The new bus rapid transit right next door to you all that's going to give people reliable transportation every 12 to 20 minutes during peak hours. That is another bond issue. It's things like that we can do. The billion dollar resurfacing of our streets, that's better street, safer city as well. But we also put housing in there last time. Only 10 million. Maps 4 put 55. We have a $1.2 billion housing need right now, specifically in their need for one to two bedroom units. If you really want to help make a dent in the city's housing and homelessness crisis, join me in advocating for the next bond, putting as much money as we can for attainable, affordable one to two bedroom housing. Ask for it to emphasize senior housing as well. If you don't raise your voice and say those things in my Ward 2 email, then it, it makes it seem like I'm the only one advocating for it when I go to the city manager and the mayor and say, this is what I think we should do. But the more of your voices you bring, the stronger we are together. I can't stress this enough. We can't just yell into the wind. We have to yell into the next bond. Channel that frustration into that bond. Channel it there. Channel it there. I'm begging you because I see the same housing and homelessness crisis that you do. And I'm a renter. And I'm a renter. Because right now, trying to become a homeowner with the interest rates is next to impossible. And I will not sit here and be shamed as a renter, not for the 10 years that I have taken care of my same apartment in the Paseo. I won't do it. I won't do it. I won't do it not with the college degrees that I've worked so hard for being one of the only people in my family to have that college degree. I won't do that. We, the days of shaming renters must be behind us. The days of moving people into home ownership must be in front of us. This is a passion of mine. Finally, Asian District. Councilwoman Hammond and I have already got together just this year, Economic Alliance, the Planning Department, Embark, to sit with the Asian district, we took a tour of the Asian district to start putting together a vision for the next bond. If this is the first time y'all are hearing this, then start following me on Instagram, James for OKC. I talk about this 
follow Joe Beth. We talk about this stuff. And we need more reinforcements to get this work done. And with that, I'd move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, um, we're moving on now to item 11M. This is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 5301 South Dimple Drive, going from R1 to SPD 1455. That's in Ward 4, Councilman Stone Cipher. No one has signed up to speak. Um, this wasn't in my list sent to me, so uh, <laughs> just give me a second. Are you here to speak on this? Yes, sir. Would you uh, give me a brief introduction, please? How are you today? Good, uh, Brother Councilman. John Pettis, 1006 Northeast 17th Street here. On behalf of the Applicant Middale School District and Community Health Centers of Oklahoma. Earlier in the year, Middale School District had to make a, a tough decision. And that tough decision was to close down Highland Park Elementary School. Middale School District built Highland Park Elementary School in 1969 to serve families in Southeast Oklahoma City. Highland Park Elementary School property is a total of 11 acres and the square footage of the buildings together is around 70,000. Middale School District searched all over to find the right community partner and they chose Community Health Centers of Oklahoma. Community Health Centers of Oklahoma was formed in 1973 by five African American women who wanted quality health care in the eastern part of uh, Oklahoma. So uh, Community Health has now uh, seven locations. Uh, we operate uh, locations in Kearney, Oklahoma, Langston, uh, Shawnee. We also operate the Hill and Hands Clinic in downtown uh, Oklahoma City. We operate uh, Perry Clawson uh, Clinic, which is on 17th and Kelly, uh, as well as our Mary Mahoney location, which is the far eastern part of uh, Oklahoma uh, County, and then our school-based clinic uh, at Millwood Public Schools. Here, uh, we are planning our eighth uh, location. Uh, we do plan on serving uh, families in Southeast Oklahoma City with uh, primary care as well as dental, pharmacy, optometry, uh, mental health uh, services, and the list goes on uh, and on. This is a great collaboration with Middale uh, School District. I do want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the city of Oklahoma City through the Brownfields program. We were able to uh, get the environmental testing done at this location, and there are some uh, environmental to, uh, issues with this piece of property, but through the Brownfields uh, program, uh, we, we look forward to being able to address those issues. The Health Center, um, I'm not aware of any protests. Has anybody filed to speak in opposition? Uh, at this time, I'd move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. <clears throat> Passes unanimously. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, the council. I do want to also thank the Santa Fe Division. Uh, the past few weeks, we've had some situations uh, to arise uh, at this particular location, and the Santa Fe Division uh, res responded within a minute. So again, thank you to the Santa Fe Division. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council. Thank you, thank you Councilman Pettis. Okay, item N was previously deferred. And that brings us to, well, do you want to go back to your item now, Mark? Are you? If you're ready, I'm yeah, ready Yeah, let's this do time. it before we kind of exit. Yeah, um, I had to do some, uh, thanks to JJ and, and our legal counsel, uh, this deals with a setback issue. I'm, I'm, I have a clarification now, so I'd move for approval of this item. OK. 
Okay, we got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. This is for item 11H. Passes unanimously. Okay, now we'll advance to item 11O. This is an ordinance on final hearing. Uh, removing the no parking anytime restriction on the west side of Cooper between Northwest 41st and 42nd, Councilwoman Knights. Yes, um, this was approved by the Traffic and Transportation Commission in October, and this is for the workforce to be able to park on the west side of North Cooper Avenue as they are expanding um, as far as the opportunity for them to use that space of this part of the building. So with that, I will move for approval. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11P is the public hearing regarding the unsecured structures here listed. Uh, Amy, has anyone signed up to speak? No, they haven't. They have not, and so we will advance to the resolution found at 11P2, declaring that the structures are unsecured, save for those previously struck. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11Q1 is the public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings here listed, except for those uh, previously struck. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak? No, they haven't. They have not, and so we will advance to the resolution found at 11Q2, declaring that the buildings are abandoned except for those previously struck. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11R is a, uh, R1 is a public hearing regarding an amendment to the fiscal year 2023 budget. This was already presented uh, at a previous e meeting, but it appears someone's gonna say something about it nonetheless. Brent. Yeah, Brent will just, Brent will just give a quick overview here of, of what we've yes uh, a very brief uh, last our last meeting on the 6th uh, Christian York provided you a presentation where we did a, did a recommending a budget amendment that impacts six funds totals about 25 million dollars as a result uh, we'll have a budget of 1.872 billion dollars for FY 23 this will be our second budget amendment for the year and if you want any detailed questions I have Letitia Jackson here from the budget office who can tell you all the anything you need to know Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Any questions for Brent? Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under the public hearing? No, they haven't. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, we can proceed to R2, the resolution adopting an amendment to the fiscal year 2023 budget. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11S1 is a claim recommended for approval. Executive session is not requested. We could take this, uh, well, it's just one item. S1A, take a motion on that. We have a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, uh, votes are done for the day. Item 12 are, is comments from council, Ward 1. Not today, sir. Or two. A thank you to MAPS Board Director David Todd uh, for visiting with the Oklahoma City University uh, student government. Uh, came by campus last Thursday, did a presentation on all the MAPS projects, the MAPS history at the student's request, and um, we had a really wonderful time learning about ways that the students there at OCU could uh, attend subcommittee meetings, make their voices heard, and advocating for um, the projects in MAPS4 um, <laughs> in terms of shaping them. So I just really appreciate Director Todd. I also just wanted to say thank you to the OCU students for uh, reaching out to me um, to uh, connect them uh, with the works coming uh, through MAPS4. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, Ward 3. Yesterday we had our first orientation for the newly formed Human Rights Commission. Um, it was an excellent meeting and I 
a lot of great minds in the room, and I really look forward to serving Ward 3 and representing the city on that commission as well as my council seat, so thank you. Thank you. Ward 6? Ward 7? Yes, um, I have a, a few. Last night, I uh, just want to say thank you to the retired firefighters uh, for the invitation to be a part and participate in their annual Christmas party. And darling Darla was definitely the still of the show. Um, and congratulations, if I may, to Mr. Fina. He was here with us uh, when our meeting started. 80, I believe he's 84 years young and just got married. So uh, we can all still find love at any age, that's for sure. So congratulations to him and his young bride. Um, I want to mention a couple of things uh, before I go into what's happening in the ward. Oh, before I forget, also want to say congratulations to Prairie Surf Media for their work with Tulsa King, for that to be renewed for another season. Um, I think that's very exciting and speaks to uh, the growth, the opportunities of Oklahoma City, and uh, in particular, Prairie Surf Media, of the things that they're doing. Now, there is a MAPS for open house for parks, and I'm still quite confused as to why some of these parks are grouped in the manner that they are, but there are quite a few. Uh, parks that are on this open house for the 8th, which is Thursday, in Mecklenburg um, Park Recreation Center, excuse me, from 5 to 7. And those would be our parks in Ward 7 um, that uh, began at Northeast 36th Street, and now they have to travel to Northwest 117th Street for open house. Um, Group C, which are going to be some of our eastern parts, the rest of the area, of uh, the ward will be on December 17th at Pitts Park. Um, but I would also encourage um, and take the privilege, if I may, that those who cannot attend for the B Group B parks to please be a part of what this presentation and open house will be for Group C uh, so they can express their opinions of what they would like to see for the said parks and locations as well. Um, I know we had Brittany Hunter come in and talk about the Adventure District, but uh, of course we have safari lights that are happening. We also have uh, quite a few other things, but one of the most exciting pieces is the Railway, Railway Museum offering the Polar Express. So if you get an opportunity to be a part of that and just experience it, I understand you will love uh, that experience. And also wanna invite folks out this Friday uh, to our East End at East Point. We're gonna do our annual Christmas tree lighting, and that's from 6 to 8 p.m., so definitely looking forward uh, to that. And this afternoon, uh, we will be doing a ribbon cutting, reveal, a grand opening, if you will, of the brand new planetarium at the Science Museum Oklahoma. So I know if you were born and raised in Oklahoma City or the area of Oklahoma County, you have spent time at this planetarium in one way or another. So very excited to see uh, the reveal of this new planetarium. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you. Yes, this morning when I came into work, um, on my desk was a letter of resignation from Judge Jason Glidewell. Um, I'm really sad to receive this letter of resignation. He does such an outstanding job, but I am happy to report that the reason that he's leaving is because he was appointed a special judgeship's position for Oklahoma County District Court. And so congratulations to him. That's a great appointment, uh, number one. But number two, I also wanted to read a couple of things he said in his letter of resignation that I think are important about how great of a municipal court system we have, and I quote, the work of the Oklahoma City Municipal Court of Record is often overlooked simply because it operates so smoothly. It's not widely known that the Oklahoma City Municipal Court completes and closes over 14,000 misdemeanors annually. That's nearly three times that of Oklahoma County District Court. Each of these 14,000 cases must have direct involvement from one of the four sitting judges. Our judges ensure that each defendant, regardless of their circumstances, is afforded a judge that is patient, informative, respectful, and fair. The court is a model of how defendants can be held responsible for their actions, but still be afforded dignity and compassionate and justice. 
Uh, I really enjoyed that. I think it's important for us to emphasize because it's often the first experience many of our citizens have with Oklahoma City when they have to go to municipal court. And so um, I will say at this time, uh, good, good luck, Jason, my friend. All right, thank you. Uh, we're now to item 13, citizens to be heard. We have a few who have signed up today. Uh, Shikufa, I apologize. Feel free to correct um, my pronunciation. If everyone who speaks today would state their name and address and keep your remarks to three <coughs> minutes or less. Hi, good morning. My name is Shigo Fahabrik. I'm from 2716 Deniston Drive, Oklahoma City 73107. Anything else you need from me, sir? No, that's no, good, okay. go ahead. So dear members of council, thank you for this opportunity to allow me to speak on the subject of homelessness. I drive around Actually, I see real homeless people. I talk to them on a daily basis. This is why I'm here today. I have taken the day off just to come express my say. I have lived in the state of Oklahoma since 1984. Never have I seen or experienced so much problem with people on the streets. Before I get too much into details, I want to just give you an example of how much I face homelessness people disobeying law and order on the streets on a daily basis, just in five mile radius of me just going to work and coming back home. I-44 junction on North May, all four corners. Northwest 36th corner of May, all four corners. Northwest 50th corner of May, all four corners. Northwest 63rd of May, Northwest, all four corners. Pen in 10th, Pen in 12th, Pen on 23rd, Let's go, Northwest 43rd and 44th, I drive every day. Behind a private person's home, I noticed five tents situated with dogs. I had to stop my car, get pictures, call 911, call the city of action, take address of this issue. People living with dogs openly on the street, they can bite anybody. Who is going to be accountable for that? Please tell me. People on streets with carts, on the bridges, on every, almost every corner I see them, and they are walking like they are drugged up. People just come bet in between my cars, I almost hit a lady once. So, this is the state of our state of Oklahoma, so I can just imagine what it is all over the American country. I came in 1984, and I hate to see this country or state go down the road that we are allowing it to go down. You're going to be a third world country if we don't stop this now, now. Don't allow people just to take over the streets. Homelessness on streets leads to crime, trash, which I see every day, everywhere. Bus stops full of people with bags, sleeping, dirtying the area. I see people from the city coming and cleaning at midnight when I'm coming home from work. 30 seconds remaining. I just, I don't have, I got so much stuff to say, but I just want to say, you don't take care of your state, your state is going in the wrong hands. Wrong way down the street, you're gonna have homelessness, you're gonna have tents on every corner, they will not move later. I come from a third world country, ask me, they will not leave the state, they will be and shit and be on your streets, and you will not be able to do anything afterwards. That's all, take care of the problem now. Thank you. Francis Looney Williams and David Williams signed up together. I don't know if you wanted to speak separately or how, what was your intent? We are all the same. Okay, all right. Well, I only mention it because we have a three minute limit per person. So I don't know if you're gonna speak separately for three minutes a piece, it's kind of up to you. You can do that. Okay, we'll start with you. I am Francie Looney Williams. There you I'm gonna to speak to you on the property of 600 Southwest 6th. My family owns a lot of property uh, down in that area. I received a letter from the city of debris to get it off of my property. I went down there to find a homeless embankment encampment. They had ladders, they had extension cords, they had unbelievable things. Finally, had to call the police because it was large. We didn't know what we were approaching. The police came. They said we could arrest them, but it just it goes through the system. They won't do anything. Do you want to give them till tomorrow to remove their things? Because they have a right. 
I have, a, I have a letter that tells me I have 10 days to get it off my property, but they have a right because they're homeless. And don't get me wrong, I am not against the homeless, but what I am against is that the city has now brought it back to the property owners and you've made it my problem. So then it becomes a problem. And the lady is correct. I fought the city, I fought everybody. I spent three days down in that area. They moved from property to property to property to property to property. The only people that show up is Oklahoma City Police Department. That's it. And it's not right. You all need to protect your citizens, you need to protect your property owners, and you need to protect your taxpayers. That is your duty. That is your job. These alliances, there is a lot of money out there. Let me tell you, the lady that is on the properties down there that is now in your easements, and the trash that's all down in there, that you all want to do nothing about, and the city trucks, I have pictures, I have videos, all of it. It's, it's, it's disgusting. I had feces, human feces, sitting on the storm drain for three days. I called everyone from the city. They came and did nothing. I called action, I called everyone. The only people that showed up was the police department, and every city official said, you know what, it's Oklahoma City Police Department's job. No, it's not Oklahoma City Police Department's job. 30 seconds remaining. And this is what we get, 30 sec seconds remaining. You need to do your job. You need to protect Oklahoma City. You need to protect the public. You need to clean it up. You need to stop the panhandling. It's dangerous. Nobody wants human feces. They don't want the drugs. The police alliance went out there. They tried to assist this lady. She didn't want the help. They were stealing electric. City people knew it. Everybody know it. You, you guys know it. Do something about it. Protect your people. You have a duty to do. That's why you're in office. Mr. Williams? Just to back, just to back up my wife, um, she was down there for three days. There's a truck down there today that's been there for weeks that's, that's stacked over the top with just garbage. The individual moves it from place to place so that he doesn't have it uh, impounded. It's just full of just garbage and trash. It's probably got, you know, rats and mice and all kinds of, it's, it's a public nuisance. Um, the only way we got any action out of any of it was for me to call the news station. When I called the news station, they told us that yes, it's a problem and they don't have any videos. And I said, my wife is there now, go down there. They, they, they came down there. I called her and let her know that the news station was on the way. At that point, she told the officers that were there. The officers then, all of a sudden, just like that, things started happening. They didn't want it on the news. Well, it was on the news. Everybody saw it. Somebody here, you all need to do something about it. They're vandalizing properties. They're not being held accountable for it. They're leaving garbage everywhere. You know, you can go down to, to, to Western and, and 6th Street, and in the easement off the side of, of the road there, there's another encampment right there. It's been there for weeks. Nobody moves. You guys don't do anything about it. There are programs out there. We understand that. We are, we are sympathetic. We pay our taxes. We do all that sort of stuff. And we want them to get the help, but these people don't want the help. The officers tell us that they don't want to be told what to do. So they want to stay out in the open. Well, that's fine. Stay out in the open, but you guys can't allow that. There are vagrancy laws. They can't, have, they can't have property. You cannot own property if you don't have anywhere to put it. They put it on our properties, and then we get held accountable for it. We get the citations. We get told 10 days or you're going to get a fine. That's not fair. We pay our taxes. We pay you guys. You guys are supposed to take care of us, and you're not. We, we, we empathize with them. I don't know what their issues are, whether they don't want to work, whether they have mental illness. We don't know that, but somebody has to help them, and that's you guys. Leaving them out in tents in, it's 48 degrees out there, and it's cold when I walked in. I wouldn't want to be out there. That's not doing them any good. 
So what are you guys going to do? Just let them sit out there until they, they end up on somebody else's property and then have the code enforcement come by and give a citation to the property owner to remove the, the property that's not, that wasn't there the day before? That encampment that was there on our property appeared in one day. One day. We, had the, we cut the grass two days before that, and two days later, we had a full encampment. 30 seconds remaining. So I don't know what you guys are going to do about it, but you need to do something. Sitting up here doing nothing about it is doing this. It's getting people involved. We are not Los Angeles. We are not the Pacific Northwest. I lived in Seattle for 10 years. It was the worst experience of my life. There's more homeless up there than you can, than you can imagine. And the tents line the, the highways. So it's just, it's, it's something you guys need to do. People move to Oklahoma to, for a good reason. That's all I got. Ronnie Kirk. My name is Ronnie Kirk. My address is 2328 North Missouri. I come down to speak on behalf of the homeless and their kids. Two weeks ago, they were going to be penalized for being homeless. Homeless in Oklahoma, it's everywhere. We have vacant schools. One of the vacant schools can be for the, the mill. One of the vacant schools can be for families. One of the vacant schools can be the, for the single person. We have so many ways that we can fix these things. Now, how can you fix something when you don't care about people. Homeless people, they're not the problem. You can't fix nothing if all you can do is think of a homeless person being a problem. These are people. They have families. They got kids. And here they are, they're just trying to survive. And we can, the only solution we can come up with is to try to penalize them, give them some help. We have all the things that we need to give them help. You got the Homeless Alliance, they trying to feed them. You got different organizations trying to feed them. You got Ebenezer Baptist Church trying to feed them. We got doctors that want, they, they'll come, everybody want a tax write off. Send some doctors out to give them exams. Send some dentists out to locations to help them. We got ways to help these people. As long as we consider homeless as not people, we can't help them. These are people, people that they have skills. 30 I'm pretty sure remaining. they'll clean the property up. Some of them can paint. Some of them are probably educated. They're just down at their worst, and we got ways to help them. All we got to do is treat them as people, give them the things we need. They're not a new race of people. These are people from all nationalities. They're just trying to survive like we trying to survive. So give them some help. At least think about some of the things that you, we, we can do as city leaders to help these people. Some of the things. And thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our citizens who signed up to speak, uh, which brings us to item 14, adjournment, and we are adjourned.